for real this time. Tight. I'll, I'll intro us in and then we'll do it. All right. Welcome to the lab, everyone. We had some technical technical difficulties and we're coming in late. I am the Zoro of Zeros, Joe Solo, your host. And with me is my first guest ever on this podcast, Mr. Jay Hill. Jason, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you, dude. Uh, honored. Number one. Numero uno. That's right. Always and forever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Looks like we have four whole concurrent viewers. Um, I Hi, believe dude. I have the chat going if no one can hear us please let us know otherwise we'll yeah that'd be no good knowing. yeah i guess hit f in the chat or something and then i guess we'll uh let's just confirm this is going we had a lot of technical difficulties there in the beginning i'm sure that's uh i'm streaming or whatever oh uh, i did have the link open and i heard something i think oh, i heard did? us oh, okay yeah i closed it though because of echo no it's fine it's fine Seems we'll just, good. We'll just get started, and uh, if we mess up, then you know, let's do it all over again, just like just like we always do. Yeah. Well, all right, let's take go five. On. Yeah, I know, take five. So Jason and I actually had like a whole like five minutes of this going already before we realized <laughs> we're streaming to no one at all. It was actually the best five minutes too. So unfortunately, it's never gonna be here heard by anybody. Oh, I know, right? Uh, I didn't even record it. I'm at least recording this now. So no, for, it wasn't good. I know. So for those of you that don't know, which is probably everybody, Jason and I went to college together, actually, back in, uh, like, okay, what back year did you start? That's where we kind of left off, actually. What year oh, did yeah, you start yeah. at Yeah, we're trying to figure out when we uh, went to college. <laughs> um, well, I know when I started, yeah. but you were you, you came in after me, though. So I went oh, in yeah? 2004. And oh, then, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I must have done it around 2006, I would say. Yeah be my guess that that makes sense yeah probably that makes a lot of sense because you came in and and you you had already been exposed to like a lot of things um i i feel oh, yes. like uh, computer art wise right yeah like you were always you you had youtube right in high school uh i don't know i don't think so like yeah. if i you mean did the world have youtube yeah, like were you learning from YouTube in high school? Because you did, you were doing Maya like compositing and modeling uh, before you even got to AI, right? Yes, I was doing tutorials um, since since I was a wee lad, as we were saying. Um, that is pretty young. Yeah, no, not I YouTube. Mean. Yeah, oh, okay. not not YouTube. Um, I did a lot of Photoshop tutorials. I don't remember the websites. I was also a part of a couple forums. Uh, oh, man, I wish I could remember. Oh, one of them was called like Psionic 3D, dude. Shout out to Psionic 3D. Oh, I don't but, even uh, know. But yeah, I was a member. No, it was super uh, small community, but uh, really like shared a lot of knowledge. And um, yeah, so I was doing those tutorials and a couple of my friends, one in particular, took an interest to 3D. Um, so we kind of geeked out together. And, uh, you know, while we're learning, we're showing up. I remember he did a keyboard I think we were using Cinema 4D probably at that time, but he did a keyboard with a letter on the keyboard and it blew my mind. I remember being like, dude, how did you put the letter on the keyboard? So yeah, <laughs> we were, we were all about learning the 3Ds and stuff did back you, in the day. Were you doing uh do you remember like those old Maya help tutorials where they, they'd show you how to like model a hammer and when you were done, all you could model was a hammer? Because like it was so just like specific, like it'd be like make a cube that's like five meters tall and make sure it's equally divided like this, extrude exactly this much from this exact edge loop. Like like you couldn't really learn anything. That's I I vaguely remember uh, those kinds of tutorials, uh, but that's probably I mean honestly uh, I still think so today. That's kind of why I make tutorials, uh, even though I don't make too many of them. But the ones like you're saying is probably really good to like step by step. That's hard to make actually. Yeah. But I I really feel like I learned a lot. Like Photoshop, like when I was in high school in my graphic design class, probably also because I was like, you know, uh, a hyper kid and probably annoying to have as a student, you know, uh, the teacher had me like demo in the Photoshop class for a while, like essentially just gave me the reins and be like, you show them how to do Photoshop. And I was like, OK, that's probably a way of keeping me like focused. Uh, sure. But yeah, I, I think I learned um, Photoshop stuff just by doing a million tutorials 
of random it's like random stuff i don't know why i would do them but you know making bubbles and just random stuff yeah, yeah there's yeah. some websites that had them every day and so i would just do them oh okay yeah yeah no that, that makes sense and, and basically you were just going through all like your own tutorials and then regurgitating them right yeah probably i don't remember the specifics but it, it remember at the time um and this is kind of true in different aspects you can probably b relate but when i was younger uh just like like if you know drawing a head on a piece of paper or doing anything in photoshop people looked at me like i was a wizard you know and i think like that fe that feeling probably um encouraged me to do that more because you know people thought i was so cool for doing that and it's easy you know but they didn't obviously they didn't see the tutorial or they don't know how to do the thing so yeah so uh it, i just remember people being impressed that i could do stuff in photoshop and i and i liked that you know so that probably was encouraging both ways you know i'm gonna I'm really going to think about like what you said there because uh, that that isn't where my brain goes and maybe it should be because yours is much more positive and like like uh, confidence building. I'm more like, dude, you know, I suck, right? Like there's actually good people like out there and I'm always feeling bad sometimes that like I'm the best artist some people know because I'm just like, oh, no, you don't understand. Like there's like, yeah. Like Colby Jukes is still walking around. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think we all feel like that as artists, especially like doing, I think all artists probably, but also doing what we do. Um, you know, I'll tell students like this is competitive art. And mm -hmm. I, and I think that's why I, I fit or I like it a lot. Like, you know, I'm competitive with myself in a way, but then I also like competitive things. Like I love, playing sure. video games and basketball and and i grew up like being taught you know trying to like good sportsmanship and how you could be positive because you can get toxic too with competition i think we see that oh 100%, so yeah 100 this, this is like yeah this is like art but it's like yeah it's co competition art everyone's trying to get more everything because it can change your life and everything yeah and you know what like i feel like we had super so healthy competition to me is when everybody is trying to do the best work they can, but each everybody's showing everybody else how to do everything so they actually can get to the best piece. Like I remember like yeah. you, myself, like Kaylin, Dan, we'd all just be in the lab every night. It wouldn't we wouldn't just be grinding. It would just be like, Hey, I found this tutorial. This is how we're rendering things things now. Like remember when we found like Lands Coast Lands Coast filter and that, that stupid render oven thing? Remember you had that script? Oh yeah. <laughs> wow you remember that that's oh. awesome dude yeah i spent so long on that script i was so stoked i feel so i, I actually it was such an awesome compliment that you remembered that script bro <laughs> that's sick that was the best mel script i ever made and then i got out of the game right there dude i was like that was too hard and it was really basic but i like i even did a ui and everything yeah dude you did the yeah, whole dude. ui i had pictures and like the ui didn't look like shit either like it wasn't just like oh it was yeah. like it looked like um Cause, cause it looked like all the plugins you would download. No, dude, I remember that yeah, because yeah. I was, I was like, dude, all of us were using all those settings. Cause, cause we're like, this is the best it can be. It maxes yeah. out all the computers. And like, that was like, the out, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was like the secondary goal. How do we max out all the computers? Yeah. Yeah. That's actually cool. You, yeah. It's another thing that, that I like remembering that, um, like, I wish I had this video somewhere, man. I'm really bad about saving old work. I'm good now, but yeah. I deleted all my work multiple times just to like, not, I don't know. It's stupid. Like at the time I was like, I don't need this. I'm better than this. Let's, let's go. I don't need to hold on to the past. And now I wish I could reminisce, but, um, yeah, I remember like when I did that animation, um, I took over all the computers in the lab, you know, yeah. like opened the file and rendered yeah. a couple frames on each computer. Yeah, those are good times though, dude. That that thing that you were talking about, that environment in the in the lab, that atmosphere, uh, I try to keep uh, alive in different ways. I still look back on that. I've talked to those guys too. It was a formative time of all of us, and I think it was it played a role in. Um, you know, have you ever thought about this? I've talked uh, with Dan and stuff about this. Like, hundred percent. That this group of guys got jobs and we still have jobs and if you just look at the placement rate of that school at all years it's bad but for some reason this small group it worked out and when i look back on it i don't i i really feel like and i don't think i was like arrogant i think i was just naive and young or whatever i never thought that you know it wasn't gonna work out like we were just learning and doing and just keep going and then uh something will happen 
and it worked out. And I worked with Dan, you know, I worked with Dan for years. Like I got him a job and I got a bounty for that. I left to another studio and then he, he left to another studio. Then he went back and got me back and he got a bounty for me at that same studio. <laughs> so, so we both got a bounty for getting each other hired at the same studio. It's funny. Oh, dude, that's yeah, dude, um, Oh, I think yeah, about that. Time. I think about that all the time, Jason. I can't like, I think about that all the time. And, and I think about the placement. I tell people all the time, I was like, it, and it wasn't even just us. Like, like there's a level designer we know, Larry Charles, like Zach Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. Like there was this whole sort of bubble of people. There was like these people who were like two years ahead of me. And then there was you who was like a year or two behind me. And there was like this bubble. And all of us were just watching all the same stuff. We were all learning together. We were all sort of doing the same thing. But you know what, though? We also sort of believed in learning everything, too. Like, everybody was like, you got to be a dope concept artist. You got to be a dope environment artist. Like, you have to be able to model a character and a gun and design the character. And it all has to look good. And it better look like the Skillful Huntsman. Like, if it doesn't look like it came from Art yeah, Center. The skillful it, Huntsman, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, there, we had just, like, these rules. And we were like, none of us could really afford to do the art center thing or the mm -hmm. some of what the concept art dot org people were doing but we were like our own satellite version like we took all those methodologies yeah. and we just did it i mean like remember when aj couldn't paint like at all and then, and I then he was, that. oh he, dude he was I, kind of yeah he was kind of popular when when i was aware of him like he kind of okay. immediately became the like chief of that group you know what i mean oh yeah because he got good like he came in, he's like, I've never painted before. And then like, he just didn't sleep and then was dope at painting. And then like, just ran past everyone. Kaylin was the same yeah. way. Kaylin's like, I I've never drawn before. And then Kaylin just kept drawing and then like, got dope. Um, see yeah. what we need, what we need to do, Jason, is we need to get all those people on one street. Yeah, dude. And we all need to talk. Yeah, that'd like, be fun. It's like a reunion, dude. Yeah. We'll just talk about old times. Kind of, kind of like a reunion, but I think, I think people need to understand like, I don't know. I think everybody has good stories about sort of what it takes and how like, you know, there's a lot of doing it by yourself, but there's also not doing it by yourself. Like I can't imagine mm -hmm. us not having the experience we had together. Like, yeah, that, that's just crazy to me. So here's, here's another way to think about it. See what you think. Um, I, it's the only quandary I have when someone asks me, is going to school worth it? And when you went to college, you know, was it good? Like, do you regret it or was it worth it? So the real question is, cause I think that um, like not the teachers, you know, not the curriculum exactly, but specifically meeting like-minded people, like, a, like the group that formed and then the energy in those labs, the fact that we were all equal, like an echo chamber of not great ideas. The like, like what you were saying is like, because because students want to do this all the time too, you know, like if they want to learn how to do a character, they're like, I'm going to design this character. I'm going to come up with the backstory. It's going to be crazy. And I'm like, listen, you got to know some fundamentals, you know, but the fact that we were all so ambitious and we had no idea, but we all were hungry to learn all this stuff. We were just had all these interests. Like I remember just being into everything. Like I, I don't, I wasn't specifically, I want to be a character artist. I just wanted to know how to do all this 3d stuff because it was, it was dope. You know what I mean? So we didn't, we just wanted to do everything. We wanted to learn everything. We thought everything was cool. And I think we were all supporting each other without realizing because we all felt that same way. And, and there was probably also something about picking out the people that you knew, like, you know, there was something about like that, that person, like you like that attitude, their positivity or whatever. Like I just, in retrospect, it seems like, like Larry Charles and AJ and Kalen, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, they were going to make it, <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't really a, a question. So you wanted to be around those people and you wanted to talk to them and it felt like another person, like another, like, Hey, you know, you're like me. Hey, let's talk about this. So anyway, so what do you think? Do you think that was worth $80,000? Oh, uh, so for us, for us, it was a hundred percent. Um, and, and there's, I, I actually would say for some of the teachers and stuff too, like we had Charles Hugh, I had Sean Dan Garen, mm -hmm. Um, I really what, like Alan Emmerich, by the way. Uh, Alan his, Emmerich, his, dude. His, he, his teachings on game design, I still think about today. They saved my life, dude. Like, he's like a prophet. Like, he said stuff, yeah, and then like it's like, come he said true. Came true. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. fuck. I, by the way, it took me years to, to be okay with that because I would look around. I'm like, you know, I would look at the other devs because I thought they learned. Because when I was in school, I was like, whatever. 
And then I wasn't even trying that hard. I wish I kept all of his papers. You remember he said, if you print out everything I made, you'd have a book. And at the time I was like, fuck books, you know? And then now I'm like, I wish I had everything he said. Damn. But uh, yeah, I would look around, man, and, and say like, dude, guys, we're feature creeping, guys. Or like, hey, the game design document isn't done. Or like, hey, how come we're not designing on paper? You know? And it yeah. turns out the whole industry is bananas. And we're just making it up as we go along, dude. <laughs> That's I tell, what it turns out. I tell this to people all the time. So I was like, so I was taught in school that if all you've got is a pile of twigs, you make a game out of that. And like, this is how you go about it. And you better be able to describe that game in one sentence. Cause if you can't describe it in one sentence, nobody's buying it. And yeah. like the game had to be unique. You know, the first rule of game design is steel. That saved my life. Like so many times, like there's, and then there's just stuff about like known knowns and unknown knowns. And like, I don't know. I loved Alan, but I also thought he was kind of like, crazy and then i go oh you're not crazy you're like the only one who knew what they were doing shit like, yeah yeah because it really is dude it's bananas and in our school dates kind of told us like they sort of preached it like everybody knows this already because remember like chung khan was from blizzard he was like the blizzard cinematics dude and then some other blizzard teacher was there for a while and all of them would just pedal like you better be dope at everything Right. Like there is no excuses. Like I know how to draw. I know how to paint. I know how to model. I made wow. I'm awesome. Like we all design <laughs> games. Like well, what I tell people is we were encouraged to be devs. Like we weren't encouraged to just be like a cog mm, yeah. machine. It's like, no, you need to be a developer. Yeah. Like you need to be able to make a game by yourself, even though that's not your job, because one day you may have to pick up the slack. I don't know. Well, that's, that I mean, that's, you. that's an awesome mindset. I, if, if that, yeah, that kind of, I never really thought of it that way, but that is how I see myself is more of a, a dev. Um, and I, and I appreciate working at places, um, that think of you more that way. There are some places where you really are, you know, I, I think uh, artists in general don't love the feeling of, um, like being someone else's hands or something, if you know what I mean, like 100%. just being a hired gun. But when you do feel more like a dev, yeah, you're like more of a teammate. You're making a game and there's more things like you're, you have an opinion and um, you can have good ideas contribute to the game. So yeah, like my experience on Evolve was cool for that reason that, you know, I got to contribute in a way. So I felt like more than just a character artist. And, uh, and I think that's a good way to make games, by the way, you know, when it's, when it's done in like behind a black box, it's not a, it's not a great sign, you know, if uh, yeah. designs happening somewhere else and it's sealed off and you're like, Hmm, you know, yeah. So yeah, I know places like Riot, for instance, really preach what you're talking about that everyone's a developer. Well, they have to be, and and, and when you think about it, because you're somebody who draws and paints, and and you create your own characters, and I, I know you work off of other concepts too, but like you've sort of been trained to tell stories, right, visually, which means that like like people don't quite understand when they see a piece of concept art, the person that created it has created an entire story in their head. They have a reasoning behind everything. You know, if the concept is very, very good and well thought out and that person is a visionary in that way, and they probably have other ideas outside of what you're paying them to do. Right. Like that's, mm -hmm. and, the, and the reason you can tell they have those ideas is because their artwork is so good. So it would, mm -hmm. to me, behoove people to ask them like, Hey, what, what do you think of, other things maybe outside of your arena where do you see this fitting in like and then not only that i think people don't even go deep enough like how how did you learn to think of things this way what are you reading like what are you doing like what are you practicing who do you watch because you may find more commonality and overlap with that person and you may find that they might be just as much of an expert as just as much of an expert as you on a subject if you just sort of scratch below the surface of what their core job is you know yeah you mean like at a studio like really getting more out of a creative person correct yeah yeah no for sure i think that's um i i do see that you know i think being uh an artist you know in in the pen you see it from that perspective as being a dev like amongst the people so I, it is something that i've noticed a lot and i feel like yeah it's like a wasted resource you know Anytime there's a really great artist and I'm thinking like they got a weird direction or they're not being asked to contribute on a new prospect, you know, or their opinions not being 
uh, sought after, I do question it. Like, man, if there's such a good resource here that's not being tapped, it's weird. And so it probably just is a is a thing that gets lost in the noise if um, if you don't think about it. But it's something I've always held on to because of what you're saying. Like, good creative people are so hard to find. I also think being an artist, maybe you appreciate that a little bit more. And, um, you know, like I'm going over there and asking their opinions all the time. So I think if you're trying to make the best kind of product, then getting all those people with good taste, you know, to tell you like what they think or what's cool. It's just a way to make things better. Totally. Another thing, you know, I think could also improve is if people more shared more of like what, what led them to their decisions, you know, like I, I tried doing a project for a quick, quick minute where I was a creative director on and um, the concept artist that I hired, what I did was, is I had him pretty much watch everything um, like film and cartoon wise that I was thinking for the style of what we were doing. That way mm -hmm. him and I could just communicate and he would know it was in my head. And mm -hmm. I, I found spending money on that up front um, saved me a lot of grief when I was talking to him because I'd go, oh, remember when this happened? And he'd be like, yep. And be like, cool, <laughs> that's what we're doing. Um, yeah, for cause, sure. cause, and, and I don't feel that like people go like, oh, yeah, you should watch this like on your free time. And you're like, no, 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 no. You need to make sure that every person you hire like sees the vision. Like they need to understand mm -hmm. what you're yeah. talking about. Right. Like teamwork makes the dream work. Right. And if they're not really aware of what the team is thinking, then they're not really on the team and they're not really going to help achieve the dream. That that's that's and that's kind of deep, right? Like I I understand so many games ship without that mentality, but that's that's what I'd like to see. Well, I think I think some of the best, the ones that stand out, and that's the other thing too, right? We're talking about art; that's our perspective. But there are plenty of games that come out and they don't have great art, uh, but they're fun, and that's what makes them good games. And then there are games that come out that look great and that are not fun, and they just blow away so we are playing a, a part in the choir that isn't required but i think the standout games the ones that people might consider like masterpieces or classics at least in our genre are a, a meeting of the minds in that way and you know even something like tf2 i love thinking about and still bring up in conversation today because of the era that it came out in um just all those decisions and the super tight, strong art direction still holds up today. That's so yep. hard to say about any project, really. It's so good. Uh, it reminds me of like Toy Story is something that I often think about because not a lot of people understand the limitation of the technology when Toy Story was made. That like literally the only materials in 3D were Fong and Lambert. Right. So... How do you make a how do you make a movie? You make it out of plastic toys because that's literally the only materials that you have. Yep. And uh, and you know they're like sleeping under their desks. It takes forever to render, but the, but the story you know it's just perfect. Like doing um, a great piece of creative work within your limitations. And I think of that with TF2, even the way that they did the marketing with YouTube videos, dude. You know, I mean it's so oh, good no, um, dude i used to yeah. crave those remember and they wouldn't make yeah. enough of them because they, they always did valve it would time. take forever yeah exactly. yeah like, yeah the no, game so, was out like for four years and they'd be like meet the <laughs> meet the guy and you're like oh my god there's a new one i have a concept floating around that's still kind of decent that i did in college that of uh like i wanted to take the heavy and do a lumberjack version and it's because mm -hmm. it was because their art style. I was like, dude, this is like timeless. Like I could do this high poly. My idea was like, I was like, I should do a really high res TF2 style mm -hmm. character, you mm -hmm. know, because because they're kind of floating that lion decker look, which I like too. But they're yeah. also somehow floating sort of this like, was it uh, like Warner Brothers Acme look at the same time. And then there and then uh -huh. there's also this sort of Pixar mixed in. And it's just it's it's so tasty. Right. Like you look at the concept okay. art and it's so good. All of it's good. The silhouettes are amazing. And then you you downloaded yeah. the models, right? Like even the topology on their low poly faces, I remember being dope. Like they just got everything they needed was just in there. Yeah. No, it is a masterpiece of uh, of video games for sure. And, and you know, like I don't think, I think sometimes, so I've, I've noticed lately, like as I've gone on, like um, you, are <laughs> You're a lead now, right? I think I saw on your somewhere. Yeah, you're a lead. Okay, so I, I was a lead for like a minute, and I, 
I've noticed there's some like smaller technical skills that are starting to like disappear, like how people work with quads and like why quads are important and just like how far you can push quads or triangles like on their own. And like, that's actually sort of an art form that now that I realize, yeah. and it's sort of starting to disappear. Uh, I don't know if Absolutely. you noticed the same. It, it will die. Yeah. 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 It will die right now. We're in a kind of a, it's a, it, for, I think for me being a lead, um, and an instructor occasionally it's made that point of view easier because it was like an art and craftsmanship thing and very hard to communicate. Like I think experience, like making a mesh and seeing it deform, uh, you know, is really the best way. And there's some principles to live by, but I felt like getting into those conversations with people still students kind of overthink topology. They're like, what's the perfect topology? How does this look? Um, but now that we've gotten more and more polygons, it's less and less important to do more with each vert. So sure. you can be more loose because if you throw more polygons at it, it's going to do what you need to do. It was the it was the fact that there were so limited that how do you make what we have work? And now that's not as crucial. And then eventually, you know, maybe if the if the claims are true about UE five uh, or whatever is going to happen in the future. Um, you know, once you're around 200, 300,000 triangles for a character, probably, I just don't think it matters. And and quads is good, obviously, for a bunch of reasons like that, you know, who would model in triangles? Nobody who cares, you know, <laughs> if you're modeling in triangles, you're doing it wrong. Dude. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. For sure, dude. Um, dude. Oh, it's so good talking to you, Jason. It's been way, <laughs> that is why I haven't had a so topology long. conversation in a while. That's good, dude. Oh, I know. That's I'm, awesome. I'm a nerd, man. Like I'm a nerd about characters, and I really don't. Oh, I'm a nerd about, about all 3D art. Yeah, I know. This is good. We should just geek out on 3D shit. Exactly, man, dude. So like, so like, like to bring it back a little bit. When did you realize that you were like gonna do art for a living? And then when did you realize you were gonna do, I guess, like 3D art? Because because that is sort of a choice, cool. really. That you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool, man. Um, so my dad, and it's funny, I just have a, a newborn now. We just have our first kid now. And so I'm always telling my wife, like, I'm going to do the same thing probably. My dad uh, bought me uh, an Apple computer. I wish I could get the exact name of it. It was like this black and white Mac. It might have been an Apple II. I don't remember. But he got it for me when I was five years old. And uh, I think my mom thought that was a little bit weird at the time. Um, but I still remember it. And um, And yeah, there was like kid pics which is like a little baby photoshop so anyways he set me up with this computer because he loved computers so he's just a geek he just loved he's like a fanatic you know he you know he just liked them yeah, yeah, yeah so he got me one and uh and i would just spend hours on it i think it was like before ipads that was the way that 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 it could babysit me you know he gets on his computer i get on my computer sure sure so i just grew up with it and then my parents were pretty strict like more strict than my peers so like I couldn't leave the house and I'm an only child and I couldn't have a TV in my room and I couldn't have a uh, video game consoles, which my dad finds hilarious and ironic now because they didn't like video games. Dude, we grew up eerily so, similar, by the way. Like, are you, Oh, really? Oh, dude, all cool. of these things. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. yeah so they kind of thought video games were evil or whatever. Um, but, <laughs> but my dad gave me a computer, you know, they didn't see the, they didn't see the hole in their plan there. So I'm just, so I'm like just trapped in my room all day uh, for like years of my life, but I could be on the computer. And then when the internet came out, they didn't get it. My parents are older. Um, so they got it. Why would they get it if they didn't even use it? I don't know. But I got DSL. The modem was underneath my bed. I don't know why they're paying it and not, they don't, they don't even know what they're doing, but they got it for me and they're not even on the internet for years. Yeah, I, I hooked them up later, um, but they were getting those AOL discs in the mail and I'm over here just like, on forums and looking at stuff, talking to other people. Totally. So yeah. anyways, living I just a whole love, life. I just, yeah, living, living a whole life. Yeah. The computer, I think that's why I have the relationship with computers I have now, honestly, because they represent so much. And now I think everyone gets that, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. before, before social media and before the internet was so widespread and common, you know, like I think the cool kids probably weren't into the same stuff, you know, like a lot of my friends, they'd have a family computer in the family yeah. room and they yeah. would all take turns on it to write a report. But for me, it, it represented freedom. And then the movie that changed my life that I always, that I always say is, is the Lord of the Rings. Um, okay. when I saw Lord of the Rings in general, 
But then when I saw Golem, I just it blew my oh, mind. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh yeah, and I just became obsessed with um with every learning, I just want to learn everything about how that was done. And then I learned that it was made with Maya and you could like pirate it, you know, you could download it on LimeWire, dude. And I'm thinking <laughs> to myself, like, you know, this movie that changed my life, you know, imagine like, you know, it's like you could get something that made this magical thing and it's on my computer in my room. And the only thing the, the only reason I can't make Golem is because I don't know how. Correct. Like I yeah. have the tool that they have in my room. So that like mind blowing thing, I think is what makes me so passionate um, is that you feel enabled. I think that's what computers do with people all over the world now is people feel enabled to do something, learn something and, um, you know, affect their destiny in a way. And the tool is right there. We know it is that it's just, it's a, it's a yourself thing to, you know, figure it out and learn or whatever. So, yeah. And then um, what was your next question? Oh, 3D. Yeah. 3D. Um. So I was uh, I took a lot of drafting classes in high school. Oh, I don't shit. know why. Dude, I yeah. did too. I'm not even kidding. Like oh, architectural oh. drafting, like like yeah. isometric yeah. drawings. Dude, I know exactly. Yeah, yeah. CAD drawings. Holy crap, yeah. dude. I still use a, yeah, a crazy. CAD pencil. Dude, that's weird. All right. Maybe oh, that's yeah. why we like See, each other. I love uh, I, I like those uh, I like those mechanical pencils and you like shave it. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so I took that. That was an elective. I think I just randomly lotteried into it. And um so I, you know, I, I've been drawing my whole was life. Was it your my only drawing a... course? Because it was my only drawing course in high school. Was it your only yeah. drawing choice? Is yeah. that why you did it? I don't remember if I picked it or if I got it. Okay, gotcha. I don't remember. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, there was an art class when I was a senior, but it was total garbage. Like, it was just a bullshit <laughs> yeah. class. But CAD was legit. It was, like, hard. Um, but when you were done, I'm also not, I still am not very good at the, at the, perfection like that high level CAD drawing requires but yeah. it taught me more about that like it was a mix of art and technical skill and discipline and I think that's what laid the groundwork for what we do now which is all those things um, but also like you know there's no undo and you know an eraser would fuck it up. like just but doing the perfect drawing you feel great so I ended up taking three years of drafting this guy his name was uh, Mr. Atsubo and I still credit him. I tried to message him once on Facebook. It was one of those things where it was like years later. I was like, I should just tell this guy that he, he changed my life. But I was in his class, right? And, um, you know, I was kind of a delinquent and kind of an asshole kid in, in high school, not taking things seriously and fa failing and stuff. But it, in the CAD classes, I was trying. and But I would, like, talk to people, you know. And so he would, like, discipline me. And um, he would kick me out. He kicked me out of his class for a while. And then one time, like he took me aside and he was like, listen, you know, if you want to go to college, you got to do the stuff like, you know, you're good at this. You could turn this into a career, whatever. And then in the next in in drafting three, like, you know, you probably did the same thing in drafting one. It's all it's all drawing. Mm -hmm. Then they show you CAD the program and you're like, what? You know, I didn't need to do all this drawing. Right, <laughs> and then exactly. in the third one, in the third one, it was 3D modeling. And that's how I found out about 3D modeling. And one of the programs we used was called Rhino. And I remember learning that they did all the buildings in that um, Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie in Rhino. And I remember Dude, thinking, they did that that's Rhino? so cool. Oh, shit. Yeah. I don't know yeah. why. I don't know why they did the buildings in Rhino. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, Rhino so um, yeah, yeah, Rhino sucks. No one uses it. No. But <laughs> Yeah, back then it was something. <laughs> and then at home, I downloaded a symbol for D. I thought that was the shit. Oh, dude. I, I would use a lot of programs. Body yeah, body paint. paint. <laughs> body paint was like, th that was the first time you could paint in 3D. Now now a substance painter is the greatest thing ever. But yeah, body paint was dope. I also used some things called Carrara 3D. My dad got me Poser. He thought Poser was cool. Yeah, Poser. <laughs> poser. Oh, cool. yeah. dude. Oh, my God. I'm having flashbacks. Carrara, that was so weird. Did you mess with yeah. Milk Shape? Like, I had Milk Shape. Like, I had Half Life. Ooh, that sounds familiar. I might, don't think I did. You're though. like a little bit younger than me. So like there's some stuff where I'm like, yeah, that was after my time. And then I'm like, oh, I think this was a little bit before Jason's time. But but like yeah. I, I had stuff like I was using Kazaa to download stuff. Like I remember getting, yep. wanting to mod the Max Payne 2 engine because it was like the only thing that came with documentation. And then I found this. So remember searching Kaza for like random freeware, just like typing shit in and seeing if you just get anything back. So like I, I just definitely like, downloaded a lot of stuff from those things. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> so like I remember getting this random like environment modeling package and, and I didn't understand what BSP was. So I was basically modeling in BSP. 
Like I just made these yeah. like intricate rooms in like all BSP thinking I was modeling, right? But I mean, was, still kind of are. I mean, there's yeah. games today I think that ship with BSP. But what I what I mean is I didn't fundamentally. I thought I was modeling, but what I was I wasn't really modeling. Um, mm-hmm. I was I would never what I built built today what I built then in BSP. Like that would yeah every everyone would hate me. Everyone would just be like, why would you do this? And you're like, well, I thought <laughs> yeah. I thought you built this lamp out of BSP. Like I was building the props okay. too, Jason. I see. I see. I see. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like here's my room and then here's my That'll bsp be lamp and then here's my yeah. bsp chair <laughs> yeah and there's a bsp character right, exactly. so this, <laughs> dude it's so, it's so funny that this is hilarious to us and there's people that don't know anything about what we're saying <laughs> like why is that funny oh my god oh, dude, wow. like there is that's the prettiest thing there, <laughs> well so, so uh, that actually brings me to something too is how insane yeah. is it being like actually on the cutting edge of technology and going like, oh yeah, we just chewed through that. Like, cause when you think about it, like oh, yeah. Un- Unreal 2004 in college seemed like a lifetime, but it was a fucking year. And then it was done. It was like, oh, we're never using yeah. that ever again. Oh man, people don't know this. I tell people, I, this is my old, my old man hat. This is kind of what you're talking about, right? The, yeah. the industry moves so fast <laughs> that I get my old, I get my old man hat and overalls on and talk to the young whippersnappers whenever I can. And, um, like the fact that you can get uh, UE right now, like I have UE on my computer. Why not? It's free, yeah. and it's it's the it's like one of the leading real time engines, right? In school, it was ten thousand dollars. I know. People don't people don't even people don't even think or re- or like really revere that. Like right when something becomes free, they're like, okay. But dude, I'm like, you know, I mean, Fortnite makes like what a billion dollars a month or something, and you can make that game. If you know what you're doing, that's the same magical thing I was talking about before. That's what's so exciting about this kind of stuff is that we all have the same tool. We're all empowered in the same way. That's what's cool about the internet. This is like the golden age of all this stuff. So yeah, the fact that like we have such good lighting now and you can do so many like polygons and, and I'm really thankful in a way, you know, um, like it was, it was a grind and I wouldn't want to go back, but I, I feel lucky that it almost like coincided with my learning curve. I really feel yeah. like that, yeah. you know, like, like when they teach mathematics, I hate mathematics, but you know, like the way they teach mathematics is like, they kind of are giving you a history lesson. You don't really know that, but they're just like, they're like gating the knowledge for you. Yeah, so they're like yeah, showing yeah. math from like a couple thousand years ago. And then in the next year, they're like, oh, here's this thing, the theorem that some guy made that made your whole last year worthless. And you're like, why didn't you? show me the easy way, but they're like building your knowledge base. That's what I think happened naturally in 3D is that we were limited and then it kept moving up the bar, but it gave us enough time to, to take those steps yeah. and appreciate where we're getting. hundred you know? percent. And, and I, I identify exactly what you're talking about. And then, and then we get sort of these gifts along the way where like ZBrush has only become like more artistic, right? Like, like I just, yeah. I, like right before this, I, I watched your Kobe Bryant thing and and I was just watching going through that. I was like, dude, we could not have done this the way Jason is doing this even like five years ago, like a hundred percent. Because you were even using the dy- the dynamic brush, I think, for moving the clothes or whatever. Yeah, the clothes. That, yep. That new fold that brush. Like we didn't have that. You just had to model. Or I mean, there's marvelous or whatever. But what are you gonna do? You're gonna stop, take it into marvelous. No. Like I hate leaving ZBrush, dude. Like that's such a I waste of time. ZBrush. I hate. Yeah. Anytime I got to leave ZBrush, I'm just like, oh, that's a broken pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> dude, I'm so stoked that they uh, were updating Z Modeler, dude. Yeah. I was just living oh, with it. Yeah, and I'm, I know. anytime Z Modeler gets a little bit better, I'm like, cool. Like, it's this janky little modeler that I just like using because I don't want to leave. That's the only reason I use it. Like, I'm just like, all right, cool. Another, I'm just faster with the pen anyway. Like, why would I go back into GIMP Maya and just be like, oh, well, I guess I'll just, <laughs> I'll pull this vert, I guess. Like, I don't, like, yeah. The way the move brush even moves vertices, Maya doesn't do it mm-hmm. that way. Like the way I do no, no. space and depth. Just sculpting. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just sculpting with sculpt with Maya sculpting brushes. I do it sometimes to do, you know, procedures like smoothing things out. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's probably we're biased in a way because we were so comfortable with ZBrush. Uh, we should talk a little bit about that, by the way. Uh, ZBrush in college, if we remember to come back to it. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. ZBrush. ZBrush's uh, brushes just feel like home now, and, and I'm just there. I'll tell you the one update though that would rock the world, man. I don't know if they could do it. I don't think they. I don't think they can do it. I'll say that right now. Until 
maybe until GPUs are, are even more buff or something. Um, because I think it's related to their secret sauce because they've had this, they've had a lock on displaying the most polygons ever because of the trickery of what they're doing. Mm. But if Z, if ZBrush in an update had real time lighting with shadows, it would, it would change the world. Wow. Dude. I'm telling you. Wow. You, you know, like you, you've set the bar way higher than me. You know what I think would change the world? Being able to use ZBrush on two monitors. If I could use ZBrush on two fucking <laughs> monitors and just dock all the shit to the side, I'd be so happy. Yeah. I'd just be like, oh my God. I, like, I mean, uh, you can hit tab <laughs> something, but. No, I'm talking like, yeah. let's, or even just two screens. Just like, sometimes I'm just like, oh, this, why am I still stuck to one monitor? Like, what are we doing? What year is this? Like, come on, <laughs> ZBrush. Like, let's, let's do this. Like, two monitors. That, that ui i feel like mine is actually more achievable because i feel like that ui is set in stone now dude the, to rewrite the whole ui that would be cool they don't need but to that it. ui looks like they just need that to ui leave. looks like it did 12 years ago oh dude it has not <laughs> changed i know it has not changed and you know what though okay so let me ask your opinion on this so i actually yeah. don't think zbrush is that complicated to use like the tagline for everybody is yes. i know zbrush i know the interface is really stupid and i'm like not really. You don't even use 90% of it. Like <laughs> that's a hundred percent agree, dude. A hundred percent agree. Um, yeah, I think I might even do a, another video about this because people ask me for my UI and I made an, a video back in the day, but I really feel like I should be able to make a short video about like how I use ZBrush because it's really not that much stuff. And I'll, I'll, so, I mean, I think we're going to agree here yeah. and I'll go even further. Like, so I don't think I don't, I'm not, pissed at the ui i think it's cool i actually think the way you customize it is very good yeah um, totally yeah you know like like the way that they let you customize it the way that you set hotkeys it's very good and then i think like so so when i say it out loud it sounds insane all right so like if i'm telling someone that's never used zbrush right and i'm like okay do you want to you want to rotate just click on the background dude boom okay you want to pan hold alt okay boom we're panning okay now it's about to get crazy. <laughs> if you want to zoom, hold alt, click. Okay, now let go of alt and then move. Boom, right? It sounds weird, but the fact that everything is on one button makes it so once your muscle memory gets it, you're doing less actions. And that's why it feels more like tactile because you're doing less stuff. So it look the the ui is is a junk drawer that's what that you know the reason why it looks like it's 15 years old is because it is and they just added features in the drawers so it seems like it seems like there's a lot of shit going on because there is but it, like like you said it's like going to a garage dude and you're only picking up the screwdriver don't get scared <laughs> about all this other shit you know what i mean I know, like totally. sometimes sometimes you need the weed whacker but it's once in a while bro you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's okay. Uh, it just looks intimidating. I'll, I'll say, you know, I'm trying to give Blender more of a shot in my free time sometimes. Mm -hmm. Until they made that update, I do think that was whack. The fact that, like, they went out of the click paradigm. The fact that every button is different. They didn't use the terminologies from the industry. I actually think that was a downside because they made a big community being a free product that's really capable. But now that big community was, like, sectored off from, e from yeah. everybody else. Because everything that they learned is now it's like it's like a completely alien language so yep. now like a whole industry is over here and then blender is literally on an island um so the fact that they're, they made some of those changes and everything made me want to give it another shot that one i actually think was preventing it and the fact that they changed it mean that they admit that to some extent too you know what zbrush does this sometimes too like they have something called rigging in there and like that is a dangerous word you're like oh rigging this must be for like yeah. binding a character to just like bones and stuff and you're like no that's actually not what that button means that's not what that button yeah. means like at all basically <laughs> like yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> at all basically <laughs> like because i i don't know man like i've gotten by a lot in 3d programs by reading you know, but like sitting there and like like going through, okay, file, okay, what is this telling yeah. me? And so when I see terms that I just don't understand or aren't even like close, yeah. I'm just like, oh, what are we doing? Because I can usually find extrude, right? You can either find like split or slice, like something. You're like cut anything, you know? Usually yeah. you have these terms going around. So I, I agree there needs to be some... I don't know. Some I think standardization there, I think a little there's bit. already standardization. I think what people there need is, to do is yeah. stop trying to like 
it's like, hey, I figured out, I think I'm going to try and figure out how to make the wheel more round. And you're like, I don't think you could do that. I think that it's already a round shape. And they're like, nah, I think I can discover an even rounder shape than round. Yeah. And you're like, mm. I mean, that's what's good about, that's what's good about Z modeler yeah. is they, it's a modeler, you know, they're using modeling terms. I'm like, all right, they, you know, definitely someone over there was trying to make a useful tool. Cause it, it goes against, cause sometimes they do like the, the iMac branding and like everything, yeah. it just has a Z in front of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. It, it's not like everything, it, can you imagine open up, it's like Z extrude and Z split and stuff. And you're like, dude, shut up. You got to type Z <laughs> and then another letter before you find any tool, like Z move tool, Z standard. <laughs> Z. Yeah. So some things start with a Z and some things don't. Dynamesh doesn't start with a Z. Z dynamesh. Anyways. Yeah. Cause it sounds, that sounds stupid. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably the reason right is that they're like let's do this new feature called z dynamesh and i was like dude i don't think we can do that. <laughs> and then when they did z remesh which came after by the way they're like no nah, this this deserves the z yeah uh so so do you okay so do you use use dynamesh right and then do you do you use z remesh yeah, a lot like, like yes okay. yeah i use both of those all the time i don't use sculptress pro is that what they call that feature yeah i don't use that either i, just, I feel like I it used to be an app on. right yeah. So whatever that feature is, though, that's what um, that's what Blender sculpt like that sculpting, sculpting in that program does. It's like a dynamic tessellation. Mm. So that idea sounds intriguing to me. But yeah, the way I work um, isn't that way. So I just I don't feel a need for it. I also feel like a grandpa when it comes to the transpose line. Like I always use the transpose line. I don't use the gizmo so do except I, for like a couple. There's a couple reasons why I use the gizmo, but. The, yeah. the fact that it defaults to the gizmo pains me every time I open ZBrush, I change it. So I, I remember this like back in the day, like I remember that like they had the gizmo and it didn't work the way I wanted. And then they got the transpose tool and I was like, oh, this is kind of stupid. But then I got used to it and I learned it and I was like, oh, transpose is awesome. And now we're back to gizmo and I'm kind of with you <laughs> where I'm like, dude, see what? So now you've given me the gizmo I wanted originally, but now I'm not sure I want it anymore because you sort of did make it better. Like, I, yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's an artsy way to do it. The the transpose line. Also, like when I bend, you know, like I I make it kind of like a bone. You know, it makes sense. Yeah. You you know what though? Like, if ZBrush though really wants to like take on the industry, it, it needs to always know where zero 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 is. Like no matter what. Like, <laughs> I completely agree with that. And and not mess up your scale. I still. It's been oh, over I ten know, years. Dude. It's been over ten years, and there is some procedure in zbrush that i use apparently that will wipe out the scale of your scene and i don't know what it is still to this day so i tell people like i literally on big projects i used to write down the numbers you know don't, yep. uh, people aren't gonna understand this but zbrush like zbrush has its own scale that is displaying and that it's never not changes one. it's not one yeah but, it's like so, a stupid but when number you import it's a crazy well 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 zbrush has its own thing and what it does is it makes a bunch of junky numbers on the thing that you're making to like reverse <laughs> to reverse engineer it. So once those numbers, it's like it's crazy numbers, like it's like eight decimal points. And there's some procedure that zeros everything out. So visually you don't see what it is, but then when you bring it in another program, it's like one millimeter tall, and you're like, oh no. Yeah, dude. So I have this yeah, other, I have that's this other uh, thing. that's crazy. Like I'll bring in like an OBJ and it'll have like one asymmetrical piece, which just like fucks up zero. So like I was doing this tutorial yeah, okay. and I was using some, I was using the mesh of somebody I was mentoring and I go, Oh, he didn't duplicate this piece over. Let me do that real quick. And that's when I discovered like X was broken and I'd already done like a bunch of work. And I was just like fucking ZBrush dude. And I was like, because yeah. I didn't like come with like, the stupid center cube or i didn't i had like something that yeah. was slightly off to the left like everything is shenanigans now <laughs> yeah it uses the it used the bounding box right yeah which is just it like, did the center of the bounding box which is stupid yeah. why give it a pivot point if it's just going to use the bounding box like, like yeah it, it, it doesn't understand the pivot point yeah no i i hear you dude I, I again i bet this is all tied to their secret sauce the fact that it's not really 3d that's right. the problem. And that's what I told people. It's because of that pixel <laughs> bullshit. Like it's not, it's yeah. never 3D. And anytime they're showing 3D, you something yeah. that's 3D, they're actually tricking you. And I, yeah. I think they already had to rewrite the whole thing once to do the fold stuff. Cause they're like, oh, it's faster. And you're like, I think that's a byproduct of the fact that to get dynamic drapery to work, you had to go back to some code and just like rewrite. And I don't, that's, I don't a, that's a good theory. Yeah. Because yeah, that has to be 3D. 
So I what I was thinking too about the lighting is, you think it's two D? I th- I think so. I I think so. Because I mean, it's got a sim it though. It's got a sim. It's got to have gravity. But it's it's not physics. the. I don't think so because they're still making you make your patterns with uh, essentially the masking tool versus Marvelous, mm-hmm. which is actually like making what like vertices and, and yeah. uh, curves. And and ZBrush is still not making curves, which says to me that like, can you not plot in three dimensions? Like, can you not actually make? I, I don't know. I, I think they're doing some John Carmack 2D wizardry to like just force it. Or maybe find I, I think I don't know. You know what? I think I think it's drawing everything in two D, but like in the claw sim, because you can you can have like a plane and drop it on a ball, right. and it'll sim. Yeah. So I think the code is all in three D, but what mm. it's drawing to this, what you're seeing is two D. Sure. That's probably sure. What, that's probably what it is. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Neither am I. Yeah, we should. We but should shit's, talk. shit's not three D though. That's what I'm saying. Is like to get the lighting in the shadows though. Like maybe once once more computers have more resources to use maybe they could kind of be doing two things so like in the background there's kind of like a proxy like a 3d proxy to make the cast shadows like i just want it to be really physically 3d and lit and you know because like when you see people working in blender that shit's tight dude the fact that you can even not only sculpt with shadows which is would be amazing but then like when they're modeling it's like it's as good as marmoset tool bag so like yeah. they're they're modeling and it looks like you're in a game engine like that's the future. Obviously, that's the future. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, Unreal wants to do that, right? Like, one day, Epic's yeah. going to reveal that you can model characters in the package, and I, I, I don't know when that day will be, but they will have tools yeah. for that, and they will. Dude, be... I remember. Oh, go ahead, dude. No, I, no, no. I, I was just bsing. You remember what? No, I was going to say like I remember still. Um, I think Unreal had this video too, but CryEngine had this video that they put out at some big event. I remember I was at a studio in downtown LA and I thought it was going to be like earth shattering that like in the demo and there was in their like mix <clears throat> of their presentation. Like they did a short like sizzle reel and in it, it's like an animator in Maya and he's like moving the character like this. Oh, we both and saw that right there is the, is the engine and it's, and it's connected. And I go, there you go. And you know what? This has never happened. That shit I, has never happened. We went to Nomen. I, we both went to that thing. Remember, they showed that big guy, look, Carlos Huante feature, uh, the Carlos Huante looking guy, and they showed the barrels, right? Like they showed some some stage or whatever. And I remember we went and we told that crazy guy with the long ponytail in the Unreal class, and we're like, Maya's gonna have a game engine. Like we saw it; they're gonna release it next year. Like they told us at this event, and that shit never came out. Nope, lies, like lies, dude, lies, hundred percent lies. That was like that event never Crazy. happened. Remember when Mike Tracy no. told us in college that Disney in 2009 was going to release a movie on film and on DVD simultaneously, like in the theaters and on DVD? He's like, because he used to no. work there and he was telling yeah. everybody at school and then that shit never happened. I, I was I was like, oh my God. And you know what? I think those are always real plans, right? And then no, something sure. abruptly something changes. Like, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and I, don't, I would love to know when a big rollout like that because that game engine thing i remember it it was pretty sweet i was like dude if i can really make the whole game in maya this this changes the game for me because when we were in college we were already like look we're, we're gonna try and make short films in maya and we, we're gonna try and figure out games but like what if the game engine was maya like i remember having these kinds of conversations mm-hmm. and oh yeah I, I don't know, man. I wonder why Autodesk backed off. I'm you know, I bet you they couldn't keep up with the service requests, right? Because Maya's got too much shit in it. Like <laughs> Well, I, I, I haven't used it myself, but I know, you know, one of the big advantages of Maya and why people use it widely in the industry is because um people have access to the back end and the front end, whatever it's called. I forget the name of the terminology, but but you edit it, you know? So that's also why it's gonna be ingrained for a long time. So ILM has its own version. Yep. You know, Weta has its own version and Naughty Dog has its own version. So they've yep. developed it for so long. So when someone's modeling a character for a Naughty Dog game, they're making the shaders in Maya and they're looking at it. So Correct. they can model it. They can see it. They, they'd use the hypergraph, you know, so it's like they're working in Maya. Whereas, you know, my experience, the engine is a separate software. And so you're like moving files and you're doing work in the engine. So far, every place I've worked at is a different engine. Sometimes it's proprietary. I mean, the Naughty Dog one is proprietary, but that's the difference between that uh, proprietary engines and an Unreal Engine is because <clears throat> when you use a proprietary engine, which is essentially just something that's been modified internally, 
Um, so there's no public facing thing at all. It's like a heavy mod, right. To make the kind of game that studio makes. Right. right. There's a lot of, uh, there's a not a lot of knowledge gaps because shit's not written down and, uh, and it doesn't have UI because it had no, you know, there, when the fact that unreal is public, it, it made the fact that it's a product now, right. It's like had forces to make sure it's usable and that there's documentation. And so that's, that's the big advantage. It can get a lot of, it can get really weird when you use proprietary stuff, but I've always been jealous of the idea of like, yeah, seeing it like the, having the same renderer of your game in Maya, but yeah, that's definitely in the future, dude. Um, and I, I'm sure ZBrush will get there. Everything will get there. Like the fact that rendering and everything is so fast, you know, we're talking about it earlier in college. It was all about mental Ray. Oh, and yeah. man, I don't miss those days, dude. Me that either. was, that was a pain, dude. There, there was something I was doing the other day, and the iteration between <clears throat> like Marmoset and Substance was like so fast for forgetting what I would have gotten in our, in our render baker in hours of rendering. I'm getting in moments, right, of just like oh, yeah. save texture, update, and I just go, dude. And th and that's actually you know why I sort of left doing movies behind. I've always been more interested in real time because I'm just like, this is workable. Like I can work this now. I, I can at least get to my yeah. final result almost faster versus like, oh, where's this going to be after you composite everything? Mm -hmm. Well, it takes 14 yeah. hours to render each pass. So it better look pretty good, huh? And you're like, yeah. hopefully like, and then if it sucks, yeah. you're like, well, one tweak. <laughs> render button wobbly. yeah yeah i know that's my problem i i i don't know why i got addicted to that stuff like i'm you know doing a lot of stuff in arnold these days for fun and that's that's what it's like um and it reminds me of the old mental ray days but way better i feel like i'm living out my dreams of of me back then because like i just you know i love movies and being enamored with all that shit the magic of 3d and all that stuff and the fact that arnold and x gen like i have access to those and those are actually tools that are used to make movies um, it's just exciting. I think it's something that, you know, I lit a spark that I've always had. So I, I didn't use V-Ray back in the day. That was the thing. Um, and I never, I never had access or something to V-Ray. So at the time though, when I was coming up and when we were in college, when I would see V-Ray renders, I would think that is where it's at. Yeah. yeah and so yeah. now that I have access to it with Maya and it's like affordable and it's on my machine, I just can't stop. You know, I love that Marmoset looks good and it's easy. You know, it's so easy to make something look good. Yeah. Uh, and it's real time. It's a super fast baker. It's probably technically the best baker. Um, but there's just something about like a good Arnold render that I just can't get over to just the, the nuance of the lighting and everything, you know, but it's, it's a pain. It's a different workflow for sure. And it's something I'm not that good at. Like I follow, um, people that work in the industry of doing look dev and stuff because there's an art to like picking the samples right and like doing a little window you know isolating passes so that you know because then you hit render right yeah it, it's hours and yeah. you can't like you said that's that's my problem is like i want to see it so like every night i'll do a render and then tweak 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 every you know it takes forever it, it does I, I think it is fun and I, I think it's a good skill to have like it's weird, man. I, I'm I'm getting older, but I still have like the dreams of like a young man, you know, and especially as the technology gets better, I feel like my dreams are closer to coming true because I go, dude, there's just stuff I wanted to do in college that I can maybe actually do now because not only yeah. is my and ZBrush better, but the tech, the other technology surrounding me is better. Like I'm shooting this right now and this isn't even 4K, but on uh, a 4K capable uh, Canon EOS 90D that I can put Cine lenses on. I own a green screen. Like I could start filming and compositing legitimate stuff. You know, everybody has access to Premiere if they want to pay, spend the monthly fee. And I just go, dude, all these skills are eventually going to like culminate in me being able to just do sort of everything myself and carry out my own vision with all my own tools. And, and by me, I mean a lot of, a lot of artists, you know, I think. Yeah. Not to get too deep, but I don't think a lot of the artists working in games right now realize how big a rock stars they are. They're, they think that just being a part of a game that ships is what maybe makes them awesome. And it's like, no, you have vision and one day you're going to have the tools for nobody to be in front of you and for you to be able to present somebody your complete vision for a very low cost, right? Like 
when you look at some of these games, you were talking about being somebody's hands earlier. That that's what's really happening, right? Like people have to spend millions of dollars to meet one vision. But what's been happening mm-hmm. is is all that's being concentrated down where it's like, well, somebody with a day job could probably fund their own dream and their own equipment. Yeah. Yeah. And and do something kind of decent, especially if they've been training in art for a while. And I think you're going to yeah. start seeing a lot of artists start branching out. You look at Vitaly right now, right? He made his game with like three or four other people and small game, high art concept. But, you know, they they didn't branch out with more than they could do. But the technology is also sort of so easy that they're able to do a yeah. lot. Yeah. No, I 100% agree. Like we're more, uh, I think you and I both are doing extracurricular things because it, it's exciting and and i feel the same way about just being having the same interest and in like you know i got a, a digital camera when i was young a computer when i was young and i do feel like all this is kind of an extension of that and an appreciation for for how far things have come and that we can get our hands on things that we dreamed about that were out of our reach but also the internet and the tools everything around us like you're saying i guess the technology world is evolving in a way where i almost feel guilty not um, trying to take more advantage of it because we're in this golden age. And and I remind myself, like, we are more enabled to, we're just, we're just the most enabled, like, citizens of any society that's ever been on the planet. Like, you know, because we're just, we're just people, you know, we're just the normal class of people. And forever, the you can't really move classes and you can't just start a business or or open a store or sell a thing or sell a trade or sell a skill you know that stuff's always been limited and very hard and we're in a world now where we are the most enabled the resistance to do any of that stuff to learn new skills or uh, create a service or a product and you know create your own small micro business it's just never been like this before and uh, and I, I feel guilty if I don't try to do something about it, you know, because <clears throat> also, I guess being an artist, um, you don't get full fulfillment, no matter how exciting or passionate you might be um, in a collaborative environment. I, I like the studio work because I like the collaboration. Um, when everything comes together, being a part of something that being a part of making something that's bigger than the sum of its parts, something that we couldn't make on our own is exciting. And the thing like the movies that inspired me, the games that inspired me, they're like that. And so that's one kind of fulfillment, but the choices, right? <clears throat> I didn't make those choices. I'm trying to do my best part. Uh, like I'm a, I'm a part of a team, Yeah. but I think being an artist and one that, you know, developed a skill over time, artist is a very solitary um, practice mm-hmm. and and uh, it's really uh, you know mostly mental and it's something that you're developing for a long time so it's like this path that you're on a solo journey in a way and so you don't get the same thing when you're on a team even though that's great so there are other ways now that are like outside of work you can be doing things that feel more in line with yourself and are more back to that original thing because when we were interested when we were learning in school, when we were making portfolios, trying to get a job, that whole time, that whole time we were in the in the lab, dude. We were we were in the lab at night, after class, like we were excited when nobody was in the room, and then we were using their computers for free, and then we would use their projector and like, you know, and do demos. We were and so we were doing that for free. We were all poor, you know. Dan was yeah. not going home to his family, and we were just there because we wanted to be. <laughs> And that's, that's the, uh, I think that's the same passion that I, I'm, I don't want to ever lose. I would be, I'd be terrified to lose that side of that. I, I don't either, man. You know, that, that passion is honestly the only thing that's kept me going. Um, I've actually had kind of a rough go of it at times in the industry, but like, I, I've actually even almost given up once or twice, but like this thing happens where I legitimately ask myself, like, what, what else am I going to do? Like, there's, I can't, there's no world where I'm not doing art in any world where I'm not doing art is like, 
is broken in some way, like in my mind, right? Like in, in my reality that I've painted. Oh, dude, so, no so, way I could get a real job anymore. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Cause you know, no I way. even, I even hear it from people and I go, dude, I couldn't even do that job. Like, I don't even know what I would do. And so what you have, what I had to do and what I think most people have to do is that's when you have to get past sort of like, that's when you have to accept what art really is. And that's the pursuit of mastery over a lifetime. Right. And once you realize yeah. that art really is about the journey and it's not about the destination and that even if you lose a step or two, or even if you get behind, or even if you're further ahead, like it doesn't matter when you get good. And it almost doesn't even matter if you get good. Cause that's almost subjective, right? Like what matters yeah. is like really putting in the effort and really feeling passionate about it and going like, dude, no matter how hard it is or how hard it gets, like I still really like doing this. And even if I don't have a job or any friends, like I'm still going to pick up the pencil and ZBrush like every single day. Like it's just, it's what I'm going to do. And, you know, even if ZBrush gets replaced by like the next thing, I can't, I can't not do it. Um, yeah, exactly. Or I think that's the right mindset, dude. That that should be the mindset. It's simple too. It's it's uh and you can lose like I've gone I've gone years where I'm just in a funk or something and I don't I like the only time I do art is at work. Yeah. And those weren't the best of times. I think they were poor, important to go through. Um but yeah, I feel like I'm in my happiest place. Like my most balanced healthy life that I feel is when I am doing that and i am making progress and and just trying to do it yeah just doing it every day and and all the things you said it's a constant um juggling act that i want to help other people with that to communicate what you're saying this that it's a, a journey not a destination and to not get tangled up in the results because you know ego is going to play a part it's impossible probably to not to but checking that ego and knowing it's there and not getting letting it letting it run the show well you, you know, know, you uh, know I, I would actually even say if you actually want to please your ego then put in the work to get good nothing will satisfy your ego more than actually putting in the work that allows you to hold up the cha the trophy and say i am truly a champion right i want to say yes dude but i just i don't know I, i've I don't met i've met some great no but the thing is i've met great artists right i like people that are ahead of me i'll I'll be like dude you're sick and you know what they they all they see is the parts that they're not good at oh for sure so it was it, i think i was like 21 and i and i realized that you know uh pattern and i just resigned myself to thinking it's part of the it's part of the journey out the destination mantra that you just said I realized that I would never get to the invisible thing that I was trying to get to. And then I, and I, it was a, in a way a relief. And I thought, okay, that makes sense. Like, cause, cause for years it was like, I'm not good enough. I'm, I just want to get here. I just want to get here. And then I realized like, oh, I'm never going to get there. Like that's always going to move. And like, it's a carrot, you know, and we're just in a desert and you just got to walk one step after the other. And then you're just going to stop when you're dead, dude. So you can only get as good as the time you're putting in. I don't think, I don't think we will ever reach the destination. I don't think so. I mean, I could be wrong, um, but dude, I mean, you heard of the story about Frazetta, bro? Oh, but Frazetta was painting on his paintings in the, in the museum. They had to, his own <laughs> family had to kick him out. out of his museum, dude. Yeah. So I, I, it's just not going to happen, dude. I, I think we're just never. And you know what? Also, it's a human thing. Like seeing all the bad things about your work. That's a harsh word, but you know, your own, that's your own feeling of it. It's like, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. I'm way better. That mechanism of identifying the weak points is part of what propels you forward. So yeah. I don't think you're going to get to a place where you're like, oh, I'm dope. And if you are, I think that's a scary thing too. Like you just go full, like I'm the best. <laughs> so I don't think that you ever want to do that. What I do think you want to do though, and this is the part that I had to struggle with. So I got to this point where I feel that my own like hating my on my own work got like so toxic that it was hindering me from moving forward because it was it was confusing me with the things I actually did know because there what there is some things you do know and when you get to that point where like you're just so toxic in your own head that like you can't even recognize when you're like hitting like basic fundamentals anymore like something is wrong right so it's like okay i know i'm never going to be the best but i also have to find some 
some center place where I understand that I'm competent or at least competent enough to get better. And really, I, I don't think, I think a lot of people aren't chasing, I think people start attributing words like good to it. What I'm chasing is understanding, right? Like I, I want to just understand more. Like I feel like the more I understand about what I'm doing, the deeper I can dive into it. And then I want to learn even more about it, right? And that's that's what really interests me. And and what the, the hang up I was getting is that I was allowing the the work not being that good to interfere with the fact that I am still practicing and I am still learning and I am still growing. So I think there has to be something where it's like, all right, if I put the hard work in, I know my work will get better, but you do have to recognize that you may not be ever be the very, the very best in a humble way and like not beat yourself up about it. Right. And understand that just because you might not be the best though, is not an excuse not to work super hard. That was the other thing, right? I'd go, well, if I'm not being going to be the best, why am I even doing this? And I go, Mm -hmm. and then you come back to, and it's like, well, cause you love it. And it's like, well, if you love it, then just be in love with the process and then just do the process. And then whatever comes from that, like, cool. And and once I started doing that and not only doing that, but bringing people like Tony Robbins and Les Brown and like more positive thinkers in my life, people who have systems for getting things done, not just beliefs where it's like, yeah, like I draw, I get up and I draw every morning at 5 a.m. So I have measurable progress across sketchbooks across years where I can chart. This is where I was at this week, exact week last year. This is where I'm at now. Ha- are the drawings better? Yes or no. And, and that's that's metrics. You can't have those kinds of metrics if you're not practicing every day, right? And you're not recognizing things. Um, yeah. And and I think people don't really understand that sometimes. Um, you know, and no, it's hard. No. It's hard to communicate. I don't either. No, I don't either. Sometimes I go. I'll go through that same journey, man. I think we both have a similar goal in um, in talking about this stuff and trying to share ideas with uh, other artists because it's really important. Um, and man, I just wish I could crack it because it, it almost sounds like cliches when we talk about it, but I understand it like so deeply and I wish I could um, impart that kind of wisdom or motivate people to to act so that they learn that lesson. Because I think you have to, I think we learned it by going through it. I mean, everything you said about being toxic and, and uh, beating yourself up or feeling guilty, um, you know, all that stuff is there <clears throat> and it's really the right attitude to just, yeah, have a system, make stuff, um, try not to lose the joy in it. 100%. Uh, and then, and then, uh, like what you said is, um, there's some uh, other famous mantra about measuring stuff. Like you can't improve anything that you don't measure. Yeah. 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 I like get the business kind of proverb or something, but that's been key for me too. Um, and man, just like just making an everyday habit, you know, when people message me, you know, that's the b- biggest question, right? Someone will say, uh, how do I get good at ZBrush or how do I learn how to make characters, you know? And I'm like, oh, geez. So I try to give them something and I tell them, you know, where to start or whatever. And then I say, just just uh, do it every day, you know, do it every day. Uh, that has to be it. And then um, and the other thing you said where you practice it like you're practicing what you preach you just you're just making stuff and then whatever comes out you know you're like cool and i think there should be a healthy amount of like a measurement quote unquote in a healthy way where you you can take something and make the next thing better yeah but to like just but to snip ties with the thing that's kind of what um you know i've been trying to do lately is to just move on and make more stuff and it's about the journey so you shouldn't get too wrapped up in the you know i used to i used to like it used to be painful to do personal work i have to force myself yeah. and you know what it felt like work mm-hmm. uh and it's it sounds so simple to say like you know do what's fun or, or don't lose sight of the joy in what you're doing but that can be so difficult um that's and that's another personal thing to overcome but if you look inward enough if you think about it enough um, the answers will present themselves on like what you want to do. And then it's not about that thing. But when I was forcing myself to do work, it didn't feel as good. And then when I would finally be done, I felt like I had this big break afterwards. Like I like, ah, you know? Yeah. And then, so I'd only do a couple things a year or something. And so yeah. too much pressure hung on these things that was like painful to even get to. 
And so uh, things got easier when like I simplified, you know, my life. And and I really credit my my kiddo here helping sure. me do that because priorities change and then uh, you make di- it's it's a perfect time to build new habits because you know after they're born for a couple months you just um you're just taking care of them 24 7 you have no you have no other life or schedule so then once she started having a schedule i started building my own schedule in a way that i would want to you know yeah and uh, just like the priorities kind of shifted but yeah man i totally understand what you're saying and i think it's good to get that message out there to other artists that need to hear it to focus on the different thing and really try to find that's the Easiest thing to say and hardest thing to do is find the things that you want to do. Don't do the things that you think uh, people want to see or whatever. Like, I I guess the other way to say it would be do what's truthful, really, you know? Yes. Um, And, 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 and if something is truthful. So for me, Jason, like, I actually know where the holes are in my game in a lot of ways. And some of them are like just straight up fundamentals. And for me, I had to like admit that to myself and I had to specifically work on draw on those like the things I work yeah. on in the morning, like specifically when I draw or other things, are the things that I actually are struggling, I'm, that are ha- that are holding me back from the advanced things. And I go, mm-hmm. I have to be honest with myself and go, it's not about finishing a bunch of characters a year. Until you understand this fundamental, your characters are going to only be here. So why don't you just yeah. spend time over here, even if it takes three years? That way... You can stop fighting that battle. You can take your stuff to the next level. And what's taken it there, taking you there is actual understanding, right? Like every yeah. day is hard. Honestly, every day is hard work. Um, I'll give you another example, man. And this goes with toxic thinking. I watched this video by Les Brown and he basically challenges the user to watch this other video. That's 35 minutes long that he did from a speak he did in 1987 And he challenges the person to, I think, listen to it for like 45 days straight every single morning, no matter what, until the chatter in their brain starts to to become more positive. Because mine was negative like all the time, like to the point where like I'd wake up in the shower and I was just saying like fucked up shit to myself just like all the time. Right. I started doing that after 45 days. I was still thinking kind of negative. I did that shit for six months. I did that until until my and it wasn't just him i started putting in like other positive stuff and then i then it kind of clicked over to my brain i'm only going to start feeding myself things that i wouldn't necessarily call them inspirational but like point you to making positive decisions for yourself and for your life or just things that like inspired me from when i was a kid like i started listening to the matrix soundtrack a lot you know and i started thinking about neo and the hero's journey and i i read joseph campbell's book and you know i just I started applying these things to my life every single day. And once I started changing the way my brain worked, I was able to really start working on my art and start seeing it for what it was and going, you know, it's not that I suck. It's that I don't understand these things. And maybe just maybe if I start understanding these things, I'll stop disliking my art so much. And not from like the standpoint of thinking that I'm awesome, but recognizing like, okay, I drew this picture. The perspective is correct right? Like (laughs) I drew this picture, the core shadow is in the right place, right? You know, just these basic things because I understand where the corners are. I understand where the vanishing points are. And to me, all of that thing, those things relate back to ZBrush and to 3D modeling because it's about depth. It's about spatial awareness. And a lot of times when you see these artists moving really, really fast, they're like, oh, they're really good. And you're like, no, dude, they're, they're thinking in such minimal shapes and forms that they're giving this illusion. It's a, it's a magic trick. But all they've done is going, okay, front plane, side plane. Okay, this plane's here. Plane, plane, plane. Okay, the skull is like always like this. Like the muzzle is always like this. And all they've, all, all they've done is flashcard themselves. And that's what you have to do. You have to flashcard yourself until your brain freaking memorizes it, right? Like, if you mm-hmm. always find your anatomy is lacking, then you need to do more anatomy, and maybe Absolutely. you need to step it up. Like, yeah, yeah, dude. Uh, I, I feel the same way. Um, so yeah, I guess to like to clarify the point about doing stuff every day and practicing, <clears throat> like mindful practice, yeah, is the way to be go. productive. And the uh, the other way of thinking about it, at least the way I think about it, and I'm gonna get a little geeky about basketball here for a second. No, do it, do it, do it. The, the way I think about um, it, and I think we all have this, right? Is we want to make stuff. Like it's almost like we want to we want to do something and we can't. 
And so there's kind of two, I think of it as two different things. Uh, and you can see that in students and people that are excited where they're like, they, they use ZBrush for the first time, they'll sculpt a head and they'll say like, ah, this is, this is my head, isn't this cool? And they're looking for some positive reinforcement, um, but there is a benefit to learning how to look at things like in the cold light of day and realizing really what I want is to make, like be very specific. Really what I want to have made is this. Right. And I haven't. And the way to get there is to practice those fundamentals and those things to enable myself to do the thing I wanted to do to begin with. Yep. So to relate it back to basketball, something I, I would think about is basketball players practice all the time. And they practice playing the game, but then they practice drills. So they they break down the game into these small moments, like you know, catching a pass and going to the corner, shooting yep. free throws, uh, shooting off the dribble. You know, all all these different kind of things. Depending on the type of player you are, too, they'll focus on this thing, right? These people are at the top of their game, and they're practicing hours a day during the summer break. All of the best players practice over the summer, so when the season's off. And then someone like Steph Curry, who's an amazing skill player, like he's someone who, uh, you know, he's really famous, but uh, he's this guy who's my body type, essentially. He's, mm-hmm. a, he's a few inches taller than me, but he's like one of the best basketball players of all time. So I only say that because, you know, LeBron is amazing and he's also an athlete. But for like this guy, this like average guy who's like 180 pounds to be elite, his skill level is sky high. And he worked on it and uh, he's famous for doing this like 40 minute drill at the beginning of every game. So his fans go to the arena early to watch him do his drill. He does the yeah. drill every time. So it's just something I would tell myself is like, here's this guy at the top of his game. Uh, you know, he's gotten all these accolades and he shows up early and he does 40 minutes of practice before playing the game. And so I think of that, like when I do hand studies, I'm doing them because hands are hard and uh, you have to, f- figure out the, all the problem solving, but it's, I'm, I'm not doing, it's not the game, you know, it's 100%. like drills. Yeah. And so I'm doing this because I wanted to be able to just play. And that that's really the thing. When you see like, when you see someone like Steph Curry play basketball, he's not thinking anymore. Right. That's, and that's, that's how good art is, is in like, like a good guitar player, their fingers are doing the thing. So you're working on your drills and so that you can play. And that's really where art is. It feels like work sometimes when you're doing drills and when you're practicing, because you're like, you know, you're being mindful about what you're doing. But I think what we all want to do is that play, is that being like existing in the zone and what you want to happen is happening. And it it takes practice to get there, but that's where the magic is. I think that's where we all want to be all the time. A hundred percent, dude. Um, I, I had a small moment like that. I, I feel like I get like, I call them visions of the future. And it's when you do something so awesome that you can't recreate and you're just like, Oh, where did that come from? And then you're just like, Oh, and it's gone. <laughs> like, so I, I was doing yeah. like these life drawing practices and, um, I didn't, I guess I didn't really look at it, but the model was actually hu- half cut off, but I drew the whole thing. Like I saw the whole pose and I just filled it all in. And I was like, Tight. that's weird. And it, it was a gesture thing. Like it wasn't like, like it, but it was like, it was a 10 minute drawing. And I was like, like when I was done and I really looked at the picture, I was like, Oh, holy shit. And I was like, holy crap, I, I actually memorized, like something in me just did it by default, which is like mm-hmm. what I feel the practice is for. I was like, okay, this yeah. is going somewhere. Like somewhere my motor skills just knew what to do. I was like, this mm-hmm. is what the training's for. Like this is why this is why I do what I do. And and I think for other people, it's why they do what they do. It's It's why they do those exercises. Like I relate a lot of things to boxing. Like, I think practicing straight lines, ellipses, and perspective, like, dude, you got to do your jabs. You just got to do your jab. Just do your jab, 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 jump rope, jab, jump rope, jab some more. Um, Just keep working on that jab, right? Just keep jump rope. And just these basic things that you have to do over and over and over again, uh, wax on, wax off. Uh, This is the secret to any, anybody who's awesome. Uh, You read David Goggins book, you read Tony Robbins, Patrick, Bat David, any of these guys, they'll... They'll just break down these drills that they do all the time. And then people will continue to ask, how are you so good? And they're like, I'm telling you, I do this. Because the thing is, the thing is usually so small that people don't pay attention to it. They go, how can that small thing by just doing 100 jabs a day be the thing that makes you the greatest boxer of all time? It doesn't make Mm -hmm. sense to them because they think 
the the fight in the ring they think that's the part that that it all comes down to yeah. but like people are rewarded in public for the things they do in private right so absolutely in, like in private they're practicing they're not just awesome like yeah. they're doing something yeah and the mileage is there and also mileage. i think it's hard i think it's naturally hard for the human brain to understand long stretches of time and things like compound interest and like exponential growth. It, it, it's unnatural in a way. So it takes a leap of faith. You know, you're hearing, yes. you hear, hear all these inspirational people um, and just believe them and do it because the moment to moment doesn't feel like that. And the no. day to day doesn't feel like that. But when you look back, you, you prove it to yourself. So you really just, that's why I think it's the simplest way to think is just live by, you know, some simple, principles of like practicing every day um you know i heard, just heard something on a podcast recently and they're talking about something else but guy who's got really great work ethic said uh i just try to be one percent better at this point and he's at like the top of his game yeah and he's like i'm just i'm just trying to be one percent better every week because then at the end of the year that's 50 percent better yeah i was like damn that's yep. pretty dope actually like 50 percent better is noticeable dude in two years that's 2x yeah, dude, one hundred percent. Phil Jackson yeah. didn't didn't he give that speech to the Bulls? I think that was in that that uh, basketball movie where he was like, he just asked them if they could all just get better by one percent because like there's X amount of team members, so like that's X amount of percent. Like it all compounds together. It's not, it's not about what you're doing right now. Sometimes it's not even about what you're doing by yourself. It's just about going through all of it. Like there's stuff that maybe happened to you 10 years ago that you're pulling out of the toolbox. Now you're like, Oh, that's a tool in my tool belt. I've been waiting to bust out. Right. Like, like it all matters in the end, as long as you keep up with it. Right. Yeah. Um, like, cause, cause I don't know, man, it, it's interesting. So I personally not to, I, I've always like looked up to you in a way I, I thought like you came in I, AI like like super super hot and super doing all this cool stuff and like you're like yeah I know my I was using my in high school and I was like well like some of us didn't have my in high school like some of us had to learn it here um, some of us didn't model our own head from the Joseph Osepa book or whatever like some of us yeah, just didn't yeah. do that Jason um, no but like it's it's this is why I wanted to talk to you and, it, and it's great. Like you're being open about it. Like it's, I think people need to hear that even people they look up to respect or whose art they think is good. Like they're people, they're going through stuff and they're probably going through what you're going through like right now. And that this is all a giant head game. It really is. And it's kind Absolutely. of a head game with yourself. It's like, it's only with yourself. I, I, it's kind of, I like it about that in a way it's, um, Art is such an important part of my life now, and I get a lot of different things from it. Um, but I, yeah, and I learned so much about life about it. But I think it's a reflection of you. Uh, I mean, art's very personal. Yeah. Um, and another way of of kind of contextualizing what we're talking about is if you practice and you follow your interest and you try to get better, you will become a better version of you as an artist. And that's what's cool about it in a way yep. because everyone will just be on their own path. You know, you're not going to get, if someone's exactly like someone else, then there's, there's something wrong going on. There's someone, there's someone faking it that like the truth is it's a reflection. That's what's cool about art is when you make something, it's a reflection of where you're at right now. It's a visual measurement that you shouldn't deny. You should be like, Oh, uh, all these holes in my game. You show someone whatever they say. That's the truth. You know. Sure, you show sure. someone their first reaction. That is that is really where you are. That's what you made. And so there's there's a cool. It's 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 a human way I think of learning to grow and and overcome these challenges because you do have to confront demons. You have to get things out of your way that you'll encounter that are preventing you from this simple goal of becoming a better artist every day. And uh, things will come up. And then, uh, and then, yeah, then it's like this battle in your head to overcome them and try to do it in a healthy way. So yeah, dude, I don't know. Arts uh, also, I kind of went on a tangent, but dude, it's funny you talk about going to AI, man. You were the cool guy, in my opinion, <laughs> at AI. <laughs> I, that's why I wanted to bring it back before. You know, you were the only other ZBrush guy and I felt very oh, yeah. competitive with you. Like you were the only, because, uh, so it's something I tell students is like, 
I don't, do you, I, you were there longer than me. I can't believe that I, w- I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to go to AI. This is also kind of, kind of a funny story that I thought AI was art center. Right. I think we all kind of, so I accidentally went, I like accidentally went to AI. Cause I was like, our art center, I heard that's good. Cause like my, my drafting teacher told me about art center and then AI send it, which was spam in retrospect. Oh wait, so you AI actually just sent- you actually accidentally went to AI. Yep, <clears throat> yep. They did a they did a scholarship competition, and I did it to get a scholarship to what I thought was Art Center, and I went there, and I realized it wasn't, and I got a three hundred dollar scholarship, and that was enough <laughs> for me to be like, yeah, I'll go here. And then, and I can't I can't believe I went there. Where, dude, normal maps weren't out. ZBrush wasn't a thing. And I really can't remember why. I mean, I, I guess it was just, I like 3D modeling. I'm interested in 3D modeling. This seems fun. Let's do it. So, it, it, you know, when you're younger, you make more big decisions on whims like that. And I'm glad that I did because I feel rich now and around me. Like ZBrush came out and it became my favorite program. Things like Substance Painter now are amazing. Uh, you know, the renders we have, the computers we have. Everything got better all by f- happenstance. I, I'm lucky about it. But yeah, anyway, so ZBrush came out and it was amazing and a game changer. I remember going classroom to classroom and just like poking my head and probably being an asshole. And I was like, anybody here know ZBrush? You know, just interrupting. And uh, everyone looked at me like, what? And uh, I was just looking for other people that, that knew what ZBrush was so that we could, you know, put our heads together and figure this thing out. And yeah, you were like the other ZBrush guy. So that's that's how I always felt like, you know, Joe was the other ZBrush guy. And an update came out one time and I stayed up 24 seven. I got the update and I started, you know, using the new features and trying to learn it. And I made a thing and I went into school the next day without sleeping. I only did that a, a few times, but I remember one of those days was a ZBrush update just so I could get a leg up, just so I would be the best at this new thing. <clears throat> so anyways, that's funny. And yeah, Danny McGowan like loved you, dude, because you had great drawings. You know, you were a, a strong 2D guy back then too oh thanks you had a sketchbook yeah Yeah. dude all the time that was dude that's what i was told you had to do like like like, i I was told that that's what you had to be to be a character artist like you you needed to be able to have these skills and at least i i I feel i was told them i feel that they were insinuated they were like oh well you you need to be able to like competently concept something and I understand what that means now is you need to be able to competently design something, which is not the same as a good drawing. Like like a design can be a design if it's loose, right? And come out good in the end. But I, I associated that with like, no, I did drafting. Drawing should be good yeah. from a technical standpoint. Yeah. Like I was trained mm-hmm. to do good drawings. And so like, I, I feel I struggle a lot with 2D. So it's interesting that Dan McGowan liked my 2D stuff because I was like, my 2D stuff is fucking terrible. Especially compared to like when AJ started crushing people towards the end. I was just like, this is getting ridiculous. Like, (laughs) how can I ever keep up with any of this? Like, it's it's really funny. But I think I think really what you're kind of hitting around now to kind of step out of it a minute is that like everyone's perception of what's going on around them and who the people are around them is different. And I was inspired by you. It's interesting to hear that maybe you were a little bit inspired by me. But like at the end of the day, not only did I like competing with you, though, but I I liked talking to you, you know, and I liked I liked sharing knowledge with you because I felt that it was more fun to compete. Again, I think we said this earlier when we knew the same stuff, because because then we could also sort of when when people around you all know the same thing and they're sort of working on the same goal you almost can see the holes in your game by seeing the holes in everybody else's or the problems they're solving. They're like, oh, blah, 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 solve this. Now I can mm-hmm. solve it. Or blah, 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 did this thing. I learned from it and vice versa. You know, I can't imagine, man, I don't know, like being on an island now. And in fact, dude, it's yeah. it's part of the reason I reached out to you the other night. You know, Jason, I, I reached out to Jason the other night because, you know, I've been doing this sculpting and ZBrush thing and i don't know i always felt jason you were you were just part of that art journey i remember us vibing and i was like dude we just had like a good effing time and Mm -hmm. i i'm five years away from 40 and i've just been thinking a lot about like concept.org and like cg hub Mm. and like massive black and like 
like the, all the old meetups and dominance war, dude. And I just yeah. go and and what I remember was is there used to be this community that was very large that all helped each other for free. And then yeah. BS and greed got involved at some point and it fractured everybody so so much that like I mean, I made my own choices, but like I, I don't know I I feel like something got broken up there and it kind of messed with everybody for a few years. It fractured the community in a way that it's never pieced itself quite to back together again. And one thing that everybody did was instead of teaching for free, I'm gonna pay all well, everything behind five dollars. And I just go, mm. I don't think that's in the spirit of why we got into this. Like, I don't want to see bad portfolios. I don't want to see people who don't like themselves because they can't get good at art. And like, I can help them. And I was helped for free. I feel I was helped for free. I feel a lot of the yeah. skills I have, I got for free. And we're talking about paying for school. School didn't teach Jason and I anything, really. Um Jason and I watched Noman DVDs and competed with the other students. And we had some teachers who pointed the way, but they did not show us how to do the super hard work. Um, not themselves. Not no. themselves, no. They, but they opened the door. They were like, hey, like this is the door. Do you want to go through? But yeah. when, when you look at the education we paid for, it was sort of like the education we gave ourselves in that lab till they, shut, till they kicked us out every night. And it yeah. was going... Like, you may have been doing ZBrush updates. I was trying to hit whatever Noman DVDs on fundamentals to stay ahead of all you guys. Because I was just like, dude, how do they know all this stuff? Like, how do they just keep knowing all this stuff? Like, this isn't even fair. Like, but it, but it was great. And, and I miss the sharing like that. And I want to yeah. do more podcasts and hang out and teaching tools. And, and not this whole... The other thing people are doing is they're doing this whole... Let's over flood people with information and content, but we'll give them no wisdom or guidance. Like, I don't want okay. to give people content, right? I want to give them wisdom. I, I want them to know, like, I saw this thing the other day and I'm not, I'm not tearing it down. It's just, it was like breaking down anime and I go, do we need a breaking down anime thing or, or do we need a, how to just break down styles in general? Like, cause, cause really if you. To be able to break down a style, you probably need to be good at fundamentals. Are we going to talk about fundamentals in this video or are we going to talk about something that like nobody understands and are we going to not point them to anything that is going to give them context mm -hmm. for what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. And that kind of stuff, it's it's not how I remember concept.org and all these other places running. Everybody always said the same thing. But people would post a 3D model with bad anatomy on a character and they would say, you need to go to life drawing class and draw. Like that was the answer to their 3D model was you need to go and draw. And it's like, yeah. what what happened to that? And it, and it wasn't about becoming a good draftsman. It was about teaching your brain to actually interpret what it was seeing properly, right? Because your eyes mess things up and your brain kind of messes things up. I want to see more of that brought back. I don't know about you, but I miss it, man. And like, I feel that like you and I not talking for a long time. I mean, we probably weren't ready for it. I don't know. Like maybe this is just that toe tip into getting back into each other's lives. Like next live stream, let's get Dan McGowan on here, right? Let's get freaking Kaylin on here. Let's get, let's yeah. give it everybody oh, on sure. here. And not only that, but like, let's all just like do art, you know? Like I have, I, you know, it could be even cool if we all got online and started critiquing each other's art, right, for people and just showing, like, how far down the rabbit hole we're willing to go on our yeah, that, own stuff. That's, uh, that's funny, yeah. I mean, because we'd be truthful with each other and, and yeah, we could put out that vibe of of this is how it is. So, yeah, back to what you were saying, too, about the, if, like, friendly competition in a way. Um, you know, I think when you're that age, too, I mean, even today, like jealousy plays a role sometimes, you know, but you try to not let it get toxic. There, It's a good motivator, um, that competitive atmosphere of like wanting to be good. And when people have that knowledge or information, um, you know, it's natural that you want it too. But the fact that we were sharing stuff, um, I really think it was that, I mean, also maybe, maybe something before I went to college too. I don't know, but I really credit that time of instilling um that mindset that um like i always have felt that way now like i don't i don't ever plan to keep um knowledge locked up like i'm not someone who thinks that uh you know my what i have achieved so far is because i have some secret thing and i don't want to give it up 
Like I, I want to share everything because I think the difficult part is the stuff we were talking about earlier. Just I, no matter how good of a speech or a video I could come up with, I can't do anything that would equal, you know, a couple thousand hours of practicing it. And so I really just, I just want to get people to do that in a healthy way and not be a dick and say, just practice more or, you know, I don't know, just, you know what I mean? Like there, there's a way to do it where you're, it doesn't feel like work. That's the, that's the trick is um, if you are following your interests, you know, I think you have some of the, we, we both have similar qualities in that self-improvement is a theme um, like just, a, you know, an urge to always, you know, the fact that you're reading Goggins and, you know, I do that stuff too. And also like um, feeding your interest, which is also something I think a lot of people don't do. Like if you're interested in a topic, no matter how niche or whatever, or tangential, you are feeding that. Like, I want to learn more about that. I, and it's, um, it's a way of getting pleasure with learning and knowledge, you know, like, and again, I was talking about, I'm a bad, I was a bad student when I grew up, I hated school. And I think some of these topics are just ones that are important to me and I'm passionate about. So it doesn't feel like the same kind of learning, you know, learning still is a kind of tainted word in a way to me, maybe because, you know, you're forced to do that when you're younger, but I legitimately could never end learning um, some of the things I'm interested in and, you know, I just want to keep doing that. And I think that's a healthy attitude. I hope to impart that. And when it comes to um, like the content, yeah, dude, I think we should all be doing more content like that. I don't think we're ever going to get back to what you were talking about before. I think the reality of the times today is that everything is fractured. And so really what it is, is it's more niches, you know, instead oh, of yeah. like poly count was the place for 3d modeling. Consulateart.org was the place for 2d deviant art was for everything deviant and crazy um and now you have these micro communities and i think it's it's people like us like-minded people that want to give back because of the stuff we got and how we got here through other people and then now we can pass it on and i also think doing both like just like the Noman dvds you know i feel like there's some ways i can contribute in ways that like take a lot more effort, a lot more serious and a lot more premium. Yeah. And so those I think are for a different audience than like, I want to keep making tutorials and videos that are accessible to people. And then the people that are really serious, like I did this too. Like I took, you know, I've taken a $500 oil painting class. Sure. You know, sure. I've taken, when we went to AI, dude, those classes were $1,200. Oh piece. dude, I went to AI and Nomen at the same time for a minute. Cause they wouldn't give me enough life drawing. It was the only way to take Charles. And it's just like, all right, like, Here's another thousand bucks on top of the twenty five hundred dollars that we're already paying here. Yeah. 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 And I that stuff I'm happy to do, especially when it's artist to artist. That was a great experience when I when I took an oil painting class from Sean Cheatham, who's a, an accomplished oil painter, uh, a portrait painter. And so that money I knew that money was going to him. And that's the very old school way, right? Of like, here's this master, and then you're gonna be the mentee. Yeah, it's and the Atelier, he, me Atelier method. Yeah, whatever, you know. yeah it, it's it's very great, very pure. You know, you're also supporting this artist rather than it going to this, you know, publicly traded corporation that later gets bankrupt. <laughs> and so it's a way to uh it's a way to to also get more serious, you know. I mean, this is just a, a side product. Obviously, it's not the main reason to do it, but when I have offered premium like learning experiences, I know that the same thing happened to me is once you put money on the line. Like things get serious. Oh. And also you you have a now you have a relationship too where I can say something and if you don't want to listen or if you don't want to show up, that's you just you know, that's your mistake. You know, and it, and it really like it, it's a it's a gate for people to really be serious. And then once they cross and they like their money's on the line, they're like, okay, like I don't want to waste this money. And now now it's a different environment. So I think there's ways to to help or educate in both those environments that that are suited better for that, you know. You know, you, you just planted sort of, man, you just, you just messed with some of my logic right now in, in the best way. Like I'm, I'm going to have to like, think about this. Um, cause you know, I, I kind of agree with that cause like premium content in a way, if done right and you pay for it or, or classes or whatever, it also teaches you to get comfortable with investing in yourself. 
right? Because mm-hmm. like like today it's a class, tomorrow it's an it's it's a Canon D ninety, right? To do YouTube videos, right? Yeah. It's yeah, but but your brain is comfortable with the investment because you're like, oh, this is gonna make my life better. Like I'm buying this with yeah. purpose. Like I bought this class. Like I understand. So I don't know, cause cause I, I think it's all about intent at the end of the day anyway, like your intention as like a person or an artist and like what it is you're trying to do. Like, I think that at the end of the day, if your only intention is to like make money, you're not going to go very far. I think if your intention is to help people, then you're going to find a lot of avenues to help people on, on all different levels. Right. Um, Cause also some people want to spend the money because they want you to take it more seriously. I, I do mm-hmm. also think that too. Mm-hmm. Somebody's like, "Look, Jason, I'm a fan of yours. I want to give you two grand because I want you to teach me, right? Like they almost feel like they have to, right? Maybe that's how you felt with that oil painter guy, right? I know yeah, I felt uh, that way yeah. with um. I took uh, what was it? it was Brian Charles? Winus. I took Brian Winus class online, uh, oh, a cool. creature, yeah, yeah. A creature modeling class. Yeah, and, yeah, and I was great. I I was super happy to give him money. I didn't even think about it. Exactly. I was like, take it. Here. Yeah. I, I, so to me, that is the that is the the great like mixture of all the things a pure thing that can happen i think there's i think we should be doing both um you know i do think information should be free and open and passed in between everyone we should all be sharing information uh, but then there's like an additional thing that we can provide in that kind of an environment that's that's like a a hyper more condensed serious version like you know that in that one oil painting class which was i don't know six or eight meetups um, I learned, you know, that was it. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to get it from a book or a DVD. It just wouldn't have been the same. The fact oh, that yeah. the first session, by the way, so I, let's say it was six or eight sessions. I don't remember something like that. The first session was he does it. And so it was just quiet. So for three hours, all the students are just there and he's just, there's the model and he's just doing it. So, so just the fact that I was like, wow, I just paid to just watch this dude in real time do it. And that was Honestly, I learned in that first thing because nowadays we have streaming, right? Um, seeing a master painter paint and his cadence and speed, I still remember today. And that's where I and that's where I catch myself when I'm doing something too fast. Like his paintings look like they have so much energy and he does them in one session. You know, it's called a la prima to, to paint in one session where the paint is just wet. And he just like looked at the model looked at the canvas, little paint, stroke, you know? And yeah. then three hours later, amazing painting. And I was like, holy shit. Cause you think you see time lapses. You just think, you know, you, it, I don't know why, but anyway, so that was a lesson in the first thing. No, I know I exactly what you're talking about. I think them. you have to move that fast for whatever reason. Yeah. You're like that's how you don't fast move you move. That fast. When you know what you're doing, you don't need to move fast. And then uh, the other thing is like, he comes around obviously, and then he gives you feedback. And then also you can ask him a question. Now that is what, is valuable now as yeah, you know as someone yeah. that wants to learn stuff that's what i know is the most valuable because that's the most valuable to me the fact that like and i and i i put this in videos there's stuff that t- you it took you and i years to learn because we didn't know or we found it in zbrush or like we found out we were doing something wrong or there was some big shortcut and so i love to give out those nuggets if i can like something that took me five years to realize and i can just tell you in in one sentence but yeah yeah like in, in curve. the curve yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, or uh, or even like poly groups or hot. Keys. Oh, poly I, groups, I, dude. I didn't do. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, but being in a student teacher environment and being able to say, "Hey, how can I do this?" or "I have this problem," and then boom, we can solve it. That I think is huge. Yeah, I I agree, and that's why, like you know, I, I'm tippy toeing right now. Like I run a Slack channel. I call it like Hack uh, Hyperbolic Art Chamber, but then also we're like hacks, right? Ha ha ha! It's a joke. Uh, to help, uh, and you know, I'm just dabbling with mentoring people cause that, that direct hands-on stuff, it's, it's invaluable really. Cause, cause you can actually fix somebody's problems for the rest of their lives with like a two minute demo on top of their work and you go, Oh, this is just, you just had to look at it like this. And then they do what you're talking about. They do it forever. Um, I learned hard, how to sculpt, like actually sculpt hard surface by finally just sitting down and watching the lead character artist uh, at Red 5 do it, like he was just doing it and I stood behind him and he just let me watch. 
and it was kind of the same thing. I didn't just see his cadence, but I also sort of how saw how he was using the brushes, and he was using like the smooth yeah. brush in a slightly different way than I was using it. And the other thing he was doing, and and it it's something I mentioned it in a video too, and it's something that's hard to tell people. The way to get corners in ZBrush sculpting hard surface is to actually treat the corner. Like people let it get round, right? And they don't go in and they don't like either yank that thing out and make it just like a nice hard corner or whatever. They sort of let the mesh be dictated to them, right? And so to watch somebody, I wouldn't even call it fighting it, tell the mesh what to do. Like that's, that's what it is. The guy went in, I watched him tell the mesh what to do. I was like, oh, okay. I would never figure that out by myself, or at least if I did, it would have been many, many years, right? Yeah. So I know exactly what you're talking about, man. I know exactly what you're talking about. And you know what, though? I think, though, there, there's a chain, a way, though, you know, speaking of niches, to, to chain all these small communities together, though, by getting, like, you and I talking, to getting everybody talking together yeah. so you see more overlap with people yeah. and start going, like, and then you start seeing like, hey, how come all these guys are good? And you're like, oh, well, we all hang out together and we all push each other to be better. Like that's that's always how it's been. And it's always probably how it's going to be. Because I, yeah. I mean, like I stalk you on ArtStation. I stalk AJ. You know, I stalk Kalen. You know, <laughs> I call it stalking. But I keep I, I keep up with everybody's work. And I just every time like you released that Kobe thing and I was like, oh, bitch, like. <laughs> 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 well, well, it's like, oh, I got to get a video or like, um, you know, I, the reason I have a foreground element is because I saw in your video, you have a foreground element, you know, and yeah, but, like, the, but the hey, reason the first I, rule of game design, dude, right? Steal. Exactly. And, and that's what people have to understand is that like one, don't just steal from other artists, steal from your friends, your friends doing something tight yeah. that you can do too. Fucking gank oh, it. Yeah. Gank it. Put your yeah. spin on it. I mean, though. it. That's that's why we're uh, that's why we put out um, stuff anyways, right? I mean, I, I hope people steal stuff. Um, there's some saying that I can't remember. It's something good about, artists borrow, great artists steal. That one. I mean, I actually do. I have it right here. I mean, check this out, dude. I mean, what could I be more topical right now, bro? <laughs> could I be more topical right now? <laughs> It'd be awesome could if I. I have other books. It'd be awesome if I, I lifted the same book. A rabbit. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, could you yeah, if you had the same book on your desk, that would be something, dude. No, I have I have other yeah. books, but it's not that it's not that book. But there you go. There you go, you have the book. That's a point, dude. Um, but yeah, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, there's something about we all rise, you know, when we're sharing information like this, when we're when we're having the healthy competition, we all want to be better, but we're sharing, we all rise together. That's that's what happened at AI, and that's what I think can always happen. Um, and also it's just something fundamental, you know. Sometimes there's a debate even on the internet whether things should be censored or the, um, you know, the internet should be um, restricted in any way. And I think the internet represents something very profound. Uh, and it's just the freedom of, the freedom of information is a big deal. And I think it makes uh, the whole world better. So I just think as a fundamental uh, intentionally keeping knowledge, you know, separate for any reason, I don't think is a, is a healthy thing. And yeah, and I don't feel like we should, any of us should feel, threatened by that like i say the hard work is the is the time with your butt in the chair and i can't i can't teach that i can just i can just push you and urge you to do it because i think your life my life ended up being much better because of that and i think uh that'd be true of a lot of people dude i i, I agree i think i i agree 100 percent, and i think that if there's a way to show people I think that there's a lot of motivational people who who talk about putting the work, uh, doing the work, and I, and I think if you can create content in a channel that like shows it, it really is about hours of your butt in the chair. How else do you think I make these con this content? Like I don't release yeah. this video and then go hit the club right after that, and like another video like magically shows up, right? And I don't magically get good unless I put time in, like. Honestly, man, it's really interesting. We talked about this before. When you when you kind of go on your own journey, journeys, especially like weird feelings of like either jealousies or whatever can start like coming in, and, and really they're they're not about other people. They're always about you, right? You know, I, I watched you pull ahead, and uh, or what I perceived as pulling ahead, and I, and I remember for you know early on that made me feel uncomfortable. Not just you, just like what did that say about me? Right. Like when when other people are pulling ahead. 
But the, the big mm-hmm. thing I came to realize, though, is I was wasting a lot of time. And when I break yeah. it down, I go, when you're looking around and you see your friends getting better than you at something, and maybe you should evaluate your life and go, you know what? The difference between them and me and right now is they're still doing art. I stopped doing art after the lab for a few years. They kept doing it. They grew. Mm-hmm. It's not that I suck. It's that I stopped putting in hours and that if I yeah. actually want to catch up, well, then I better catch up and start getting my butt in the chair and I better start putting in more hours than Jason. Like, that's the only yeah. way now. Um, but then, <laughs> but then too, this is what actually everybody does, you know, and some people either stay up or they get up. I get up and you stay up, right? I think that's the thing. I get up at 3.30 a.m. Yeah. I go to work. You stay up till like 3.30 a.m. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you have to have that just time. Because of my, uh, my daughter, um, so that's how the schedule worked out. I think early rising, they both have their advantages, but at the end of the day, I am tired. And so I, I do think um, doing things first thing of the day is probably better. Yeah. But um, they're, both, they're both important. So do whatever you can. I make don't know. It, make it work. Do you think though, like for you, like like to me though, uh, not to get woo woo, but I I started believing in some like woo woo ish stuff, and I go, <laughs> well, no, that I feel that sometimes these hardships are necessary for character building, and not 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 say oh, it's yeah, a hardship, absolutely. but like uh, you go, okay, now is the time in my life where the only time I get to make art for you is I have to stay up. How much do I still really want my dream? Am I just going to stay up yeah. and do it? Right. That's because that's the mind game. Right. Because it's probably way easier yeah. for you to just go to bed. Right. You can just go to bed. Yeah. I don't even, I don't even think that's woo. That's concrete stuff. I mean, that's the stuff that like David Goggins preaches. Um, and it, it's part of, you know what? It became the, so I used to be kind of fat, you know? Dude, what are you and that's it. <laughs> I guess I, I missed that. Fat. I guess I missed that. Yeah. You kind of, you kind of <laughs> missed. No, I got kind of fat in college. I, that was my heaviest. Yeah. I got to like 193. I, I'm pretty short. So that's, that's a, that's a good amount. All right. But anyways, so that's another uh, challenge that a lot of people have to uh, confront, right? So I had to learn about, uh, you know, exercising and eating and all that stuff. Um, so everyone's got to crack that sometimes. Not everyone, but most people have to crack that. Um, and the key that. to me was going to the gym three times a week, no matter what. And again, and not being about the destination. And then, uh, and then it just became going to the gym and not bitching out anybody who's gone to the gym knows knows this going there without a plan picking up some weights that feel kind of heavy doing it for an amount putting it down you know and then and then later when you leave and you're not sweaty you know what i'm talking about and you're like i went to the gym and then there's going to the gym and you have a plan and you're and you're tracking it and and when you're done you barely finished and you're sweaty and you feel like crap and um that like completing that. And I used to do that early in the morning. So I used to wake up at five and go to the gym and do that. And that, I felt like that made my days better because then when I went to work, everything else that day was, was not like, I already did the hardest part of my day Yeah, yeah, yeah. was in the morning. And, uh, and I overcame a challenge, you know, and I think that is character building. And I think that same thing of getting myself to work and, um, and all the little discomforts, you know, every time I would start a hand from a sphere, I think, I don't even remember how to do this. How do I do this? You know, every time. And I, and I, and I tell myself, just start making the hand, dude. Don't be a bitch. And then right. I start doing it. And then, and then, you know, after a little bit, listen to music, it just, it, you know, it's okay. But just doing that constantly, I think, wears away those stones you have in your mind. Like, I think, I think the younger people, like, that might have been a blocker for me before. Mm-hmm. Sitting down, looking at a sphere and thinking, dude, I can't make a hand. It's going to look like shit. Yeah, that that might have been enough to prevent me from even trying. And so I think overcoming these little things is a is another form of skill building and practice that makes you a better person as well as artists. It's just overcome just doing challenging things. And I don't stare at challenging things are good. And yeah, trying to be comfortable all the time. That's all. That's often how I think of it. Being uncomfortable is a good thing like overcoming discomfort so every day i make myself uncomfortable intentionally you know three times a week i'll exercise uh i'll make myself do art um and i try to do it in a positive way like i don't try to like um chastise myself i just try to make sure that i'm not being comfortable so like when i do like sit on the couch and watch a movie and eat like popcorn and chips 
I feel like, yeah, dude, I'm just going to do this today. Like I earned that shit and not just feel like a fat ass, you know, I'm doing that every day and like, and feel guilty that I'm not in my chair right now. Like I, I feel like I already did stuff and I earned this, you yeah. know? So anyways, I, I don't think that's woo woo at all. I think that's legit. I think that's legit part about being a better human is doing that stuff. I think I do. I, I agree. I, everything you said, especially about like the, so I do the same thing. I get up, I jump rope, I do whatever. Um, and actually, I started doing that even before I started going down the Goggins route. Like, because I, I grew up um, playing, I didn't play high school sports, but I grew up doing all like the local sports through junior high and being a Boy Scout and going camping and doing Dude, all these yeah, a- athletic scenes. Yeah, did you know you really? Were you really? <laughs> we, we blows, dog. We blows. No, I. <laughs> we blows. I I was a I was a Boy Scout until I was like seventeen, dude. I like I stopped at Eagle because I was like, dude, I think this is stupid. Like, I don't want to go camping anymore. Did you not get Eagle? No, no, I, I did st- not get. Eagle. I didn't either. I stopped right before they were like, "So are you gonna go for Eagle?" I, I, and I was like, "No." I was before Eagle, and I and I regret not doing it. I was like, dude, I made it the whole way, and then I bitched out. But anyways, go ahead, dude. I did this. I kind of did the same thing, but like. <sighs> In retrospect, I think it was the right decision because, you know, I, I did Boy Scouts and sports for my parents, but what it did yeah. was, is it sort of taught me this discipline. And then later in life, I went through some things and then I got presented an opportunity. And when I got presented in this, that opportunity, I had a choice to make. And, and the choice was kind of, I call it being an adult, but being an adult, like I knew I had to start hitting the gym. I knew I needed to get my mind right, my body right, and like part of my spirit right and aligned to do the task at hand. Because if I didn't, I was going to destroy myself like I did before, right? By somehow Mm -hmm. not doing these rituals, by not sort of keeping myself in, in, it's like a car, right? Like keeping it tuned up and like purring. It was, it was actually working against my art because now I can stay up longer, right? Like now I have more energy. Now I'm, now I'm also less anxious when i sit in the chair right like i don't feel like i have to move around a lot all of these yeah. things but then the, the other thing is is i i start feeling more confident about myself as a person right because mm-hmm. you, you start there's something and this is why i love fight club and this is why i love boxing there's something about testing your physical limits as a person that makes you believe that you can go further like in these analog and digital realms and i don't know what it is there's something about going like, man, I really sweated it out today. I think I can really sculpt something good today. And and then also knowing that like you're handling things that like keep your spirit and your conscious clean. There's something about all of that sort of aligning that allows your art to come from sort of a different place from just this grit and bear it. Right. It kind of just goes like. Yeah. It sort of feels more like you're doing what the universe wants you to do as opposed to what you want to do and that you're sort of opening yourself up to just being this conduit uh, conduit of creation, right? And and inspiration, which is why I got into art in the first place, you know. I think that a lot of people they get caught up with Like I got into games because I thought of games as art forms. I felt games like Final Fantasy 7 and Metal Gear, like they touched my life. They changed the way like I viewed things. And I was like, wow, dude. Like when I played Metal Gear, I was like, this person has taste. Video games can have taste. Video games can be adult. Video games can be like movies. I need yeah. to be as good as I can so I can be Hideo Kojima. I need to get as good as I can because to me, this is where high art was going. I was like, oh, now we're telling these interactive stories and we better be good at it. Like we better be good at it. And I think a, a lot of people, a lot of games that are made now, they don't, they don't quite inspire me like the old ones, kind of did. So, mm-hmm. and and I think that, I think that's because the industry has kind of changed in a little bit. But I still want to help people, and I still want to do art for like those reasons, right? Like I don't know about you, if you were inspired by that early stuff. Well, um, it's kind of ironic that I got into games, you know, because they didn't get me, my parents didn't allow me to play games. So I didn't play any Final Fantasy game, um, but uh, games did make a big influence on my life. Uh, The main one, I saw, so I saw my friend playing Metal Gear. I've seen the first level of that Metal Gear game a lot. 
the coming out of the water and knocking yeah. on the thing. So I've seen that a lot. I never played the full game, but I was aware of it. I thought it was really cool. Then the game, I the game, the first game that I remember having a huge impact on my life was uh, GoldenEye. Okay. And the four player split screen on GoldenEye, I just thought it was so fun. And then uh, later on, you know, like I said, I, I grew up with a with a Mac at home. I still have a Mac now. Yeah, I know. And at the pun. time, you couldn't play uh, Counter Strike on a Mac, right? And then um, yeah. And I, did, I didn't know that. I played a lot of Quake 3, which was cool. But there was this computer cafe that, that opened up in our city when that was a thing. And um, so we would go there after school. It became a cool thing that kids did in school. And you would go there after school and play Counter-Strike. And there was like in that community, there was like a famous kid who was <laughs> amazing, you know? And uh, and one. you would be there and you'd all be playing. And I just like that, that those feelings and stuff. Uh, were huge for me at that time. I went there with my friends. We would stay there for hours. We would play. Um, and then uh, the next big one was Call of Duty 4 on console. Revitalized that for me on console now. So that was like, I was playing a first-person shooter. I remember like playing a first-person shooter on a console with my friend. And I was like, this is great. Like, holy shit, they did it. Because I remember thinking like, I wish Counter-Strike was on console so I could play it at home. Right. And uh and I, I remember Orange Box came out and I and I tried it and like, you know, TF2 on, on there was terrible. And I was like, what is going on? And then um, and then, yeah, Call of Duty was just made for that format, I guess. And for some reason, it unlocked it. The fact that I was playing a multiplayer shooter on console and the big the big one before that, I think it was before that. Yeah, it was SOCOM. And that was the that was the most influential game of my life. There's a game called SOCOM and then SOCOM 2 U.S. Navy SEALs. That was the first online game. It was the first online shooter game. And so it was a PS2. And so my parents got me a, P- a PlayStation when I graduated eighth yeah, grade. That was yeah, like a yeah, big- yeah, yeah. They're like, now you get a console because you're older. And I was like, okay. And um, so to play SOCOM, we had to go to the store and buy a modem that came out later. I remember it goes in the back. back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you plug it in and then I got online and like, and then there's other people and there was no friend system, you know, the party system wasn't there. So I was like writing people's screen names down on paper when I thought they were cool. I was like, dude, yeah. we're going to play again, bro. And like, I met somebody on there who was in the military. Uh, I called him, I called him geek. Cause that was his name. His name was geek USA. He was on a military base in Washington and we like became pen pals, dude. So I met him yeah. online. I thought it was funny. And then every day for like two years, dude, at night I would play this game and it, we met a third guy. And so we made this little clan and we were playing online and dude, it was just magical, man. I can't, I could go on and on about it, but like we were, we had real relationships. I made real friends. There was real heightened emotions and it was exciting. And if it weren't for that, I would have just been in my room by myself and uh, it was formative years. And yeah, so that stuff I think made games extremely important to me. And then when it came to the art though, I think I always held like things like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars up there. And I think I think there was a part of me that always thought I would uh, move on to Weta or ILM at some point. I don't know why I thought that, but then the game industry got better and better and more exciting, and uh, you know it just naturally fit. And I think I think there was a new frontier. You also heard I also would hear stories about that dream I had not being real. You know, people I would know would get a job at ILM or get a job at Weta, and it and it didn't live up to the thing, the picture that formed in my mind when i when you know when i was on the outside so i think games just represented uh, an exciting new frontier that some of the most inspirational things for me they were on that you know yeah like jurassic park and terminator 2 for those people for those that small group of people it was exciting times and then it became you know more of an industry and games is this new wild west so i think that was exciting i think that's what lent us to be you know making moves and trying to get in there and make things happen. I don't know. Just, it still seems that way. It still seems like, like UE five coming out. It's exciting. The new consoles are exciting. Um, it just keeps getting better and better. I mean, the fact that, you know, we have these phones that are literally better than playstations. Like oh, we all yeah. have them. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's just, uh, it just, things get better and better. Technology has been insane. So, yeah, dude, it has been insane. And it's, it's been kind of like an interesting ride. And I agree. I, I feel like all of our goal was to work at ILM and shit in college. And, and I, maybe it, I, 
maybe it wasn't so much about the <laughs> maybe job. Was. Maybe it was more about the quality bar. We were like, this is yeah. the caliber of stuff we want to make. We want to be able to make stuff that's so good it can be a digital double. We want, because we would talk about this, right? We'd look at the Vancouver cool. Film School reels, right? And we go, oh, we need to yeah. make shit like that. Like, like that's yeah. the bar. Because, and that, and that's why it's hard for cool. me. Like, I don't think that I suck, right? It's just that my bar, I'm like, okay, so where I am on my own bar is like down here. Because my bar is like, dude, I, what I want to do is so far down the line like I, I i understand exactly where i am in comparison to that and what i'm working toward but like i do have a bar and i'm not satisfied with where my work is at and maybe i'll never be satisfied like maybe maybe as human beings we move the goalpost back right like maybe maybe you're going to get to that point where like you finally achieve the thing but you don't recognize it right you're like yeah oh still suck and so you you push the goalpost back but my goalpost is not, hey, can I make a better drawing than I did in college? My goalpost is still, how do I do the stuff they did on John Carter? How do I do the stuff they did on Rogue One? They used a whole VR thing. And that leads me down a whole even rabbit hole of it's not even just about the modeling. It's about how did they pull off that shot? Okay, if yeah. I were going to do that shot, what would be the best way to go about it? Um, and, and I think this is the mindset you that we've always had. I think that it's yeah. the mindset a lot more people need to adopt. They need to realize that it's, it, again, it's not about the product. It's about understanding the process. And, and I've always liked breaking down the process. There's something about it that's always been fun. And it's also why I've, I haven't, like one day I'm going to make a movie and I don't know if it's going to be good or bad. You know, I don't know if it's going to be in theaters or whatever, but I'm going to like fuck with it. And it's just because I have to, and it's for the experience. It's about the process of it. It's not about making a good movie. It's just like, oh, like, I don't know. I think I can really do this. And the tech is kind of cool. Yeah. And like, why not? I mean, like, dude, we can get a couple LCD screens right now and some unreal assets and start making like ghetto Mandalorian in our living room. Right. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I, follow, I follow the guy on YouTube that's building that. Yeah. So there you go. I mean, what is it? Cinematographer database. I forget his name, but yeah, he's yeah. doing that at home. Exactly. So, so like, like you can, mm -hmm. and you can even do small scale stuff where you're like, Hey, you can even do that with claymation now. Like you do claymation with like green screen and all this other stuff. Cause you've got all the cameras. And, and I think that what's really happening is we're getting back to that. Like we're getting to a new digital Renaissance age where like we can become like Renaissance, like people like men and women and, and whomever where like everybody can just do the best version of art. Like like the tools are about to get there and I'm kind of excited for it. And I, I'm excited for the fact that like even um, <laughs> like I'm excited for the fact that more people are, are seeming to be interested in getting good at this stuff too because it allows us to see like more good art. Like I want to see more good art. I hate seeing art that's like bad or not fun or like like just like oh I dropped the ball like this was supposed to be good why you know like i just want to see everything be good because i want to see some everybody chasing that like goalpost they're just going to move back yeah <laughs> well um so yeah i i totally feel that um i've had this conversation with people too about you know what happened and and there's so much stuff out there at a lower caliber nowadays and and even, you know, not to throw too much shade, but, you know, ILM being in the king of the, the pile, now they have a wide range, you know, where sometimes they put out something and you're like, oh, that's that's ILM, okay. And then at the same time, they'll put out Academy Award-winning work. It's just, that's the business now. And uh, But this is what I think. I think the rate of great creative work hasn't diminished. It's it's at least stayed the same. It's probably grown, but what also has happened is because of this enabling that's happened on all aspects of every entertainment, every angle of the entertainment industry, there is more stuff. Mm. Uh, mm. So that's a good thing though. But sure, because sure. of that, there's more noise, you yeah. know, but yeah. I think people really haven't considered how profound it is that something like Netflix exists and Amazon Prime and HBO Max because if you th if you think about Hollywood, dude, how many of those big directors are there? Do you know? You know, exactly. like ten or yeah. less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like movie studios, 
three, like, I mean, like visual effects studios that do the top tier work, like the tentpole movies are only a handful, but the only way, so I love Lord of the Rings, right? That's my Star Wars and all that stuff. I'm the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. that's my thing, it has a special place in my heart. But Game of Thrones wouldn't have been able to exist. And it's a, and it's an amazing work that, and the scope of it is insane. But that couldn't have existed. It can only exist in this climate now where just like you and I, there's people that are inspired. They come up, people that wouldn't, the people that couldn't have gotten those jobs at the temple thing, people that couldn't work on, Schindler's List or Star Wars 10 or whatever. And here you have all these people that are great that now have this opportunity. And it's like everybody on that show, nobody knew of. Yeah. And now it's like, and they're all amazing. And they're, and they're not only doing like people used to think people used to tell me um, that Lord of the Rings was too long. And then game of Thrones becomes a worldwide phenomenon. It's a, it's a hard R show. They deal with tough subjects you know, they show like gore, there's complex politics. And it's like, what is it like a hundred hours long? And it's fantasy. It's, it's dark, high fantasy. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's an amazing piece of like cinematography. So anyways, I just think about that show a lot and how incredible it is, but also how that's a great example of something that only exists because of this, because like they use the area Alexa camera, which is an amazing digital camera. Uh, so they, they, you wouldn't have been able to shoot that show on film. You wouldn't have been able to do all the visual effects. You wouldn't have been able to do the dragons, which were sculpted in ZBrush, by the way. You wouldn't have been able to do all that stuff at the price, at the quality, at the time. So really, it's a culmination of every aspect of the entertainment industry getting to where it's at and then people at the top of their game. And they come together to make this epic work. dude. I mean, I can't get over uh, how that was a show. <laughs> it's crazy but yeah so that's happening everywhere and that's going to happen in games too and what you said about vitaly is dope and uh so true and, and it's things things i have in the back of my mind all the time when i met when i meet talented people like a really talented gameplay engineer or animator or something like yo let's keep in touch dude because maybe one day maybe we can make a thing you know <laughs> yeah dude and you went okay so and like you have always been like that dan has always been like that like you guys have just always dabbled with stuff like it's always been like oh like maybe we'll do this thing and it, and, you know, I think I think those maybes, like the more maybes you can have as an artist sometimes, like those are like these like those little drops of inspiration, right? And like these gold nuggets to like or like these bread crumb, crumbs to try and chase that like may lead you to greatness, right? And you're like, because like one of these days, maybe one of these maybes might turn into like a yes or like yeah. maybe all these maybe people that you met, I don't know, you're working with them one day and... I don't know, you're all making a little bit of money and you can pay to have some stuff done, right? And you can start just bouncing things back and forth. And, and when I talk about a little bit of money, I think it makes I, people think we're talking ballers numbers. I'm like, no, like very small, very, very small, you know, paying somebody's hourly rate essentially for mm -hmm. a piece of concept art or things like that, which is becoming less expensive when you think about it, you know, paying a, a concept artist like say fifty dollars an hour and only you know needing them for eight to ten hours that's that's not that expensive really to like do your own project and to get like some professional work done yeah for what you're getting yeah yeah um and and we're gonna get to a point where not only do some of these things become cheaper but again the technology becomes cheaper where you're like cool i can spend a little bit here i can do the rest for free and unreal yeah and I did it all by myself. So unless I make a million dollars or whatever, like, I don't owe anybody any money either. Like, yeah. And you know what? You're going to start seeing. And what, they're, what it's going to be is it's going to be like nine and 10 year old prodigies who just make us just like face palm. Yeah. 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 No, definitely. Um, I mean, I think about that, you know, you talk about inspirational games and everything too. I just, I did want to mention Genova Chen being a, a game designer that I consider, um, the next generation. You also talked about games being an art form, which is a, which could be a big and controversial subject to some people, sure. but I agree with that. And I think Genova Chen, the guy who, uh, who made, um, he started with flow and eventually so Sony locked him up or he started with cloud. I think it was called and then did flow for and Sony flow. and Sony yeah. locked him up into a contract and he made several games, including flower and then uh, journey, I think was the last one. And then he did sky right now on the phone. Anyways, um, that guy, I love hearing him speak, and you can see in his work. I I, I I think of him as like 
a guy who is, you know, you think about those kids, like the younger millennials that like grew up with the internet. Like this is a guy who grew up with games being like a solid, like Kojima was a thing. Right. And it's so cool to see how he like is learning. He gets what game design is like yeah. this communication, this like new form of emotional um, design that you're designing the emotions of the player to get. And if you're going to tell them a story, you have to design them going through the emotional yes. thing. Yes. And it's a, uh, it's an, it's an, and so it's great because you see like in flow to flower to journey, he's, he's gradually opening scope. So I really think of him as a, I don't know about a prodigy, but a guy, a, a young, he was young. They, he was in college when he made his game and then they got him from that college even tried to like get his money, dude. What was it? Uh, USC he was at USC and he made his first game on some iMac in the lab there and they were trying to get his money dude everyone everyone trying to get a piece of that guy so I I'm always interested in his career I think he's doing it for the right reasons and he's like an artist you know uh, and he's yeah. his paintbrush is game design and uh, you see some people jump and their first game is like it's a military simulation post-apocalyptic thing with like big guns and tanks and shit and it'll be like open world online MMO and you're like bro I don't know if you know what you're what you're talking about this is crazy and this guy is like i just uh what if you were a i want to i want to make people feel like they can fly and then he he designs a minimalistic game around that yep. uh, journey was an awesome experience i played that and i got the experience that he wanted meeting the people figuring out how to communicate with them uh anyways i don't want to go on too long anyways uh i agree with you about the new wave of people and you we can learn a lot from them because they take seriously the things we take for granted and they they don't second guess themselves the same way for them what they're doing is serious yeah and um just like when we were young you know they're not they're gonna they're gonna show us the way probably and i think the stuff that unreal is doing i'm so happy about how epic has treated their their success um you know riot Riot got a big uh, dragon size amount pile of money, you know, and uh, it kind of grinded to a halt in terms of game production. They've yeah. now since put out some games. I'm happy about that. It seems like they've turned a corner, but for like six or eight years, you know, the word in the industry was like, what happened? These guys, are they going to do it? Like, I think they were so worried about the sophomore slump. They were so worried yep. about their second game not being a hit that they just couldn't do it. And it, it felt like an artist's brain the stuff we were talking about, like the thoughts you have as an individual, it seemed like as a studio, they were having it, that they would start yeah. a project and go, that's not good enough. They would start a project. Ah, oh, it's not good enough. And I was like, dude, I don't know if they're going to get out of this. It seems like they got out of it. And then in Valve's case, you know, I've seen a, a game studio that was just like hit, 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 classic, classic, classic. And then slow, like again, in these cases, what's common is that they, they, they hit an echelon of success, like billions of dollars. Uh, <clears throat> so an amazing amount of success both those companies found. And then Valve got a little bit weird. And they they didn't make the same kinds of games. And they didn't do it at the same pace. And they were a lot more wasteful with their money too. And they would cancel a lot of projects. So I was really worried that Epic, it was going to happen Epic. Because Epic, what they're doing in the game engine space was more profitable than their games. You oh know, yeah, their yeah, game, yeah. Their games weren't weren't profitable. I mean, to put it bluntly, and then uh, Fortnite now brings them an unprecedented amount of success. And I was so worried that they were going to stop updating the engine because now they have no reason. Like Valve, like Steam doesn't get updated because they're making a bunch of money and they're like, why would we update it? I mean, now that other com there are some competitors, you know, let's see what happens. But without competition, without that real urge to do it, you know, you can easily just sit on your laurels. So I'm so happy to see Epic still push the tech, still drop updates, still fix bugs. Uh, I'm I'm just like they are a force for good in the industry. After Fortnite, they also using Fortnite servers. They're allowing um, like indie developers to have like dedicated server tech. Like that's always been one of the biggest hurdles. Like I love competitive shooters, right? So if I were to ever make a, a dream game, a dream project, it would probably be a competitive shooter. Yeah. And one of the biggest hurdles has always been network programming. Like you, you have to get a talented network engineer. Yep. Then you have to figure out servers. 
And it's a big deal. It's harder than, I don't even fully understand it now, but I've learned that that is a big hurdle. And now Epic has enabled people in that way to use their tech that's already set up. So yeah, that's just my praise for what Epic's doing for the industry. And and it's it's things like that that are going to enable, similar to what happened with movies. You see Netflix and Amazon and HBO having great content at a quality just like movies are better. And you didn't think that was possible before. And I think we're going to see that. I think we're going to see games, you know, you and I have probably both been a part of the like 70, $80 million triple A tentpole kind of game. Yep. And that's what keeps the industry up right now. That's what a lot of people work on because that's where the jobs are at. It's good security, a bunch of reasons why it's good. And also you can make dope ass games. Um, but now that tech's moving like this, yeah, I mean, more people can make those kinds of games um, in, with smaller teams. And that's exciting. The future looks really good. Future, the future does look really good so i think let's see we're approaching like twelve thirty. i know i've got to like use the head um yeah i think maybe yeah. we should wrap up this one but like man I, i'd like to do another one of these i think that we've only gone like halfway through our, our the conversation we need to have man um, yeah this was good man it naturally flowed uh it, it was fun talking to you again dude it, it's probably good that we haven't spoken in a while and we just did it on podcast i didn't realize till you mentioned it but i was like we probably didn't speak for years and then just our first conversation is just like let's record it yeah and it worked out oh totally this was fun yeah was i could do fun. this forever man so we'll definitely do it again yeah we'll definitely do it again uh thanks for coming on man and um dude let's just keep in touch i you know what so to be, I think to be fair, we haven't talked in like five or six years, and then there was like maybe a four year gap between that, and so I think yeah. I think we need to cut that out. Um, I think we just need to, I don't know, we need to get the the band of misfits back together, making their own stuff, but sharing it with one another and uh, and and the world, I guess, but mostly yeah, for our, I, for our I, own amusement. That sounds that sounds dope. Um. I think I think we should do that. Let's contact these guys and let's see. I mean, let's see if we can revitalize uh, at least some of the energy from the lab back in the day, and uh, and yeah, just just get the band back together again and try to make things that also can help people if they want to do some of this stuff too. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, thanks for being on the inaugural podcast and hanging out in the lab, dude. We have not hung out in the lab since like what 2009. So this was a good time, man. I missed it. Perfect. All right, dude. Well, Thank I'm you, gonna, dude. I'm going to cut this stream and, uh, I'll, you know, I'll hit you up probably this weekend, man. Okay, cool. All right. Take care, everybody. It's been the Zorro ZBrush, Joe Solo, and this has been In the Lab with Joe Solo brought to you by Sculpting and ZBrush.